Hello there. In this tutorial, we are going to be creating Breakout in Pygame. And for this project, I really wanted to make sure to include graphics, updates, sounds, and all the stuff that makes the game actually look good. So we don't just have a boring game that is, well, just a demo. And all of this is going to be part of this tutorial. And I guess there really isn't that much else to talk about. So let's jump straight into the first part, the project setup. I already have a couple of things ready in the project, so I don't have to type out some boring bits. And before we are going to look at our code, we have to talk about the folders. Let's have a look at those. I have one folder with three subfolders. We have code, graphics, and sounds. And code right now has two files, main and settings. I will have a look at those in just a second. Besides that, we have sounds and graphics. Sounds is the easier one. We just have a couple of sounds. That's basically all it is. The graphics folder is a bit more extensive because we do have quite a bit in here. So we have blocks, other and upgrades. Now other is quite simple. We just have a couple of basic images. And besides that, upgrades has a couple more images. That really isn't anything complicated. Now the one more complex folder is blocks because what we have in here is a lot more folders for each color and the player. And then inside of each of these folders, we have a lot of smaller graphics. I will explain later what they actually do. We basically use them to create a proper surface for each of the blocks and the player. This is basically all we are going to need for this entire project. And we are going to work in code entirely. So in here is where we are going to do everything. And with that, Let's have a look at main and settings. And here I have both of these files open. And if I run all of this, we can see a plain black window that doesn't really do anything right now. And I guess before we properly start with this project, let's talk through what we already have. Main.py is the main file, and this is much more important. Settings.py right now only has the window width and the window height. So that determines the width and the height of the window. That one should be fairly obvious. And this is what we're importing up here. Now, besides that, we are importing Pygame and Sys to make Pygame run. And time, we are going to use for delta time. And then we have a fairly simple class. And once we are creating this class down here, we are creating one instance. And then we are calling the run method of this class. So let's have a look what happens inside of the class. It's not very much right now. In the init method, so up here, we are essentially just initiating Pygame and creating a display surface with the window width and the window height from settings. And then in the run method, we are using this last time here along with these two lines to get delta time. And then delta time later on is going to be used to update all of the elements in the window. And besides that, we have our event loop that right now only checks if we are closing the window. And all the way at the end, we are updating our window. So we are drawing whatever we created, but right now we haven't created anything. So all of this is black. And this is our entire setup for now. It's really simple and just about the most basic setup for Pygame you can have. If none of what I have just said made any sense, check out my introduction to Pygame. It is going to explain all of this in quite some detail. And I guess for this section, let's add a really quick challenge that should be fairly easy. So right now, if I run this code, we can see in the top left, we have Pygame window. And I want to rename this to breakout or to really any kind of custom string. I don't really care so much what it is. And try to do this yourself and see how far you get. In the init method, we have to call pygame.display.set underscore caption. And then here we have to pass in a string, in my case, breakout. And that is going to rename the caption of the game. So now we have breakout, which looks a little bit better. All right, so with that, we have the first section covered. And the first major section I do want to work on is to create the background. And this by itself isn't terribly complicated, but there's one major issue that we do have to work on. 
that the background image always has to cover the entire window. If it didn't do that, it would look a bit weird. So we have to scale the background image. But when we are scaling it, we want to make sure we have a constant aspect ratio. So we're not squishing the image or making it wider or narrower than it's supposed to be. Now, what does that actually mean in practice? And let me illustrate. Here, we right now have our window or a box that has the same size as our window and we have the background. And this background, we want to stretch. And we can stretch this in a couple of different ways. We could, for example, stretch it like this, which in this case would work, but it would stretch the image a tiny bit, which I don't really like. Instead, what I want to do, I want to scale this thing with a constant aspect ratio so that it grows in width and height at the same speed. And this, I feel, looks nicer. Although in our case, the background is so abstract, it really doesn't matter very much. But this is essentially what I want to achieve. So let's try to implement all of this and let's see how far we get. Here I am back in the code. And the first thing I want to do is to create another section in the init method. And let's call this one background. And all I really want to do in here is create another attribute called self bg. And this bg is going to be created in another method that I called create bg. And this needs to be self.createBG. So now we have to create this method. So define create BG. And the only argument we need in here is self because we don't pass anything else in there. And now, first of all, we have to actually import an image that I want to store in BG original. And this we get with pygame.image.load. And I want to go up a folder. I want to go to my graphics folder. In there, we have a folder called other. And in there, we have bg.png. And don't forget to convert this one for Pygame to run a bit better. And now what we can do just to get started. I want to return this bg original, meaning that after we have run this, our bg gets this surface. And right now, all of this is a bit of a pointless setup, but we are going to add a bit more in this method in just a second. But now I just want to make sure this is working. So now essentially what I want to do in my game loop before we are updating the window, let's call it draw the frame. And in here, all I really want to do is self.displaySurface.blit self.bg at the coordinate zero and zero. And let's see what we get. And there you can kind of see the issue we just had that our background doesn't cover the entire window, which, well, looks kind of bad. And there's one easy thing you could be doing. So right now, we want to scale our BG original. And the result I would like to store in, let's call it scaled BG. And to scale anything in Pygame, we need pygame.transform.scale. And in here, we need two arguments. We need a surface, and we need, a, let's call it a new scale. Now the surface we already have, that's our BG original. And the new scale would better be named new size actually, because this one is going to be a tuple with a width and a height. So for example, what we could be doing, we could copy the entire width of our window and place those two arguments in here. And now if we are returning scaled BG, what we get is something that fills our entire window. The problem now is that we are squishing our image. So this image is more narrow than it's actually supposed to be, which in this case isn't too much of a problem, but in lots of other games, it would look very silly. So this is something I want to work on. But if you want to leave it like this, that's also totally fine. And let me explain by illustrating the original image. So BG original. Essentially what I would like to do in here, I have the height of this image available. This is something Pygame can give me. Let's call this one H. And I want to multiply this one by a certain number. Let's call it a question mark for now. And the result of this multiplication should give us a new surface that has the height of this 
entire window. And let's call this one HW. And once we have this number, I want to multiply this with the width of this image as well. So this entire thing here is also going to be multiplied with this yellow question mark. And that way we are scaling both the height and the width by the same number. So the aspect ratio of this image is not going to change. So the question then is, how can we get this question mark? And I always feel like plotting in real numbers here is the best way to think about it. And the height of the image we have right now is 512. And the height of the entire window is 720. So essentially what we need to figure out is 512 multiplied by what number gets us to 720. And this is the sort of thing that's really easily solvable. Essentially all we have to do is the question mark is going to be 720 divided by 512. So we just move the 512 to the other side. And that way we are going to get the number of our question mark. And the number we would be getting here is something like 1.5. So I essentially want to multiply this 512 by 1.4. And I also want to multiply the width of this image by 1.4. And well, that is basically all we are going to need. Now with that in mind, let's implement all of this. And I would actually recommend you to try to implement this one yourself. So now you know the basic theory, this shouldn't be too difficult to implement. First of all, I want to get some kind of scale factor. So that's the 1.4 I just got. And in here, we want to get the window height and divide this by the height of our background. And this we get with dot get underscore height. So now, we can print our scale factor and let's see what we get. And what we get is 1.4 and a tiny bit. So this is looking really good. So now we can create a scaled width and a scaled height. And basically what we are going to do in here, I want to get my BG original and get the width and multiply this by the scale factor. And the same thing I can do with the height. So bg original dot get underscore height. And I want to multiply this by the scale factor as well. And now, finally, I can uncomment my scaled bg. And I don't want to pass in window width and window height. Instead, I want to pass in my scaled width and my scaled height. And now return the scaled BG, and let's see what we get. And this one is looking significantly nicer. It's probably kind of hard to see, but it does look better. And it's one of those many small differences that all combined really makes the game look nicer. But all right, with that, we have our background. So that's a pretty good start. So now that we have that, we can start work on the player at least to a certain extent. Let me explain what we are going to do. What I want the player to be able to do for now is that the player can accept some input, the player can use that input to move around, the player is going to be constrained to the window, and that's kind of all we are going to do. Later on, the player is also going to receive graphics and lasers, but I don't want to get ahead of myself, let's keep it a bit more focused. So let's just work on these three parts for the player. And none of them is particularly difficult, so let's jump straight back into the code. And here we are. And what I basically want to do is to create a new Python file. And this one I am going to save as sprites.py. Because in here we are going to have all of our sprites for the ball, the player, the blocks, basically everything. And this one is going to import pygame and from settings import star. And now I want to create a class I called player and this should be spelled properly. And this one has to inherit from pygame.sprite.sprite. And now we are going to need an init method for this setup. 
And this one for now is only going to need groups. So the groups we want to place this sprite in. And which group we would like to place it in, we get in the dunder for super init method. And in here, if we add groups as an argument, Pygame is automatically adding this player to whatever group we pass in here, which is really handy. And now I want to, let's call it setup. So I want to add self.image. And for now, this image is just going to be pygame.surface. And now we need a width and a height. And both of these sizes should be relative to our window, which basically means that I want the width of the player to be 10% of the window and the height of the player should be 5% of the window height. And achieving that is kind of simple because we already know the window width and the window height. And basically all I want to do is I want to get my window width and floor divide this by 10. And that way, I get 10% of my window height as a nice integer that is a bit easier to work with. Although you could also just divide this, it doesn't matter that much. And for the height, I want to get my window underscore height. I am terrible at spelling that. And floor divide this by 20. And that way we get 5% of the window height. And that is all we needed. So now I want to get my self.image and fill this one with a red color. Now the color here doesn't actually matter that much because we are going to replace all of this later on anyway. For now, I just want to make sure it's not black, which would look a bit boring. Now we have our image. Next up, let's add a position comment in here. And I want to actually place this surface. And for that, we need self.rect. And this we get with self.image.get underscore rect. And in my case, I want to place the center of this surface. And for this one, I need X and Y. And for the X coordinate, I want this to be straight in the middle of the window. So window width and divide this by two. I guess to stay consistent, let's floor divide this, but this one really doesn't matter. Now for the Y position, let me draw what I would like to do. This here is going to be our entire window. And my player, I would like to be somewhere here-ish with some kind of offset from the bottom. And in my case, I always want there to be a 20 pixel offset between the bottom of the player and the bottom of the window. I guess if the window gets really large or really small, this might be an issue, but I think this is generally a good number. So how can we implement this? And well, the easiest way is that this center isn't perfect here. It should instead be mid bottom. Meaning now we don't place the center of this rectangle, we place the middle of the bottom side. And now basically what we can do, we can get the window height and from that subtract 20 pixels. And that way, when we are placing this rectangle, there's going to be this distance between the bottom of the player and the bottom of the window. So with that, we have a very basic sprite for our player. Let's actually display it in main.py and see how this looks. And this could be a challenge for you. Try to display this sprite on the window. It doesn't have to do anything for now. Just see if it can actually use a sprite. First of all, we have to import this sprite. So from sprites, import player. And now to actually use this sprite, we have to place it inside of a sprite group. So let's call it here group setup. And let's be a bit more specific, sprite group setup. Because later on, we are going to have quite a few different sprite groups. But for now, what I want to create is self.all sprites. And this one is just going to be pygame.sprite.group. And we are going to place every single sprite inside of this group. And this group will then draw and update every single sprite. And any other group we are going to create later, we'll just check which kind of group another sprite belongs to to check what they are supposed to do. But none of them are going to update or draw anything. And now let's create another comment 
and let's call it the setup for sprites. And basically what I want to do is self.player is going to be the player class. And in here we need one argument and that is groups. And I only have a single group and that is all sprites. So this is what I want to pass in here. And if I run this now, we can see nothing because we have to draw all sprites. So self dot all sprites dot draw. And I want to draw this on self dot display underscore surface. And now if I run this, we can see our player. This one is already looking not bad at all. So now our player can be seen. And to move it, first of all, we need to get some kind of input. So for that, I am going to create another method I call input, and this one doesn't need any arguments. And now I want to get every possible keyboard input. So pygame.key.get underscore rest. And now I want to check if inside of this list we get the right or the left keyboard. And if we don't get either of those, we are not going to do anything. But if the player is pressing right or left, I want to give my player a direction. And this direction has to be stored in the class itself as an attribute. So let's create self.direction. And this one I'm going to create as a vector. So pygam.math.vector2. And this one by default can be left empty, so it's zero and zero. And now if these and pygame.k underscore right, then self.direction.x is going to be one. And now we can copy all of this, turn this into an L if, if the player is pressing left. And if that is the case, x should be negative one. And finally, if neither of those are the case, then self.direction is going to be zero. So basically, all we are going to do here is if the player is pressing right, we have a positive direction. If the player is pressing left, we have a negative direction. And if the player is pressing neither of those two, we have no direction at all. And now that we have that, we have to create an update method, not upgrade, update. And this one itself. And importantly, we are also going to need delta time. Because remember, we want to move this thing with delta time. And we don't have any clock, so our game runs as fast as our computer can run it. So if we didn't use delta time, our game would not be running at a constant speed, which would be kind of a problem. But this we can account for. Now, in the input method, first of all, I want to get myself.input. And now we have our direction. Now, what you could be doing now is something like self.rec.x plus equal self.direction multiplied by some kind of speed and multiply this by delta time. But this wouldn't be a good approach. Although speed, we do want to use. Let me actually create this one. So self.speed. By default, I have set to 300. So this one we can keep as it is. So self.speed is totally fine. The problem we have now is that using self.rec.x and adding numbers to it is not a good way to move anything in Pygame. Because rec.x for the position only ever stores integers. And this number here is going to be some kind of float. So if we were to use this number by itself as the position for the rectangle, we would be losing information. And the way around this is to create another attribute that I called self.position. And this is going to be another vector. So pygame.math.vector2. And by default, the position of this vector is self.rect.topLeft. So the top left position of this rectangle. And let me place the vectors right next to each other. And the vector can store floating point information totally fine. So essentially what we are going to do is self.post.x plus equal all of this. And that way we are not going to lose the information after the decimal point. And once we have that, we're going to set self.rect.x to the rounded version of self.post.x. 
And this round here is not strictly necessary, but it is kind of helpful. Because when we set rec.x and we pass in a floating point number, high game drops any value after that period. So for example, if we had 1.9 in self.post.x, self.rec.x would just turn this into a 1. And if we are rounding all of this, this one becomes a 2, which is the much better number here. So, all right, with that, we should be having some kind of movement. Except there's one thing I forgot. We have to, in our game loop, update the game. And all this really means is self.allsprites.update. And in here, we have to pass in delta time. And let's see if this is working. The game doesn't throw an error. And if I press right, now we get an error. The problem starts in the update method. And in here, high game has the problem that int object has no attribute x. So for some reason, it thinks this direction.x is an integer. And the reason for that happens down here, that if we don't press left or right, we are setting self.direction to zero, which isn't what I intended. Instead, we have to set self.direction.x to zero. So we want to set one part of the vector to zero. We do not want to set the entire vector to the integer zero, which would be, well, pointless. And I guess while we are here, there's another thing I did forget, that this is going to throw an error as well. Because right now, this is going to be an integer. This is a vector, this is an integer, and this is a floating point number. The problem is we couldn't really add a vector to an integer. Pygame just wouldn't know what to do with it. And this, well, has to be self.direction.x. And now this should be working. So now I can move around and this is working totally fine. And it feels very smooth. So that's a pretty good start. Now the problem we have is that our player can move outside of the window, which doesn't feel good at all. So that's the thing we have to work on now. And all of that is just going to be another method that I called screen constraint. We need self and nothing else. And now we have to figure out the basic logic in here. And I think this one could also be a pretty good challenge for you. So try to figure out the method here that our player cannot leave the window. It shouldn't be too hard. If you want to tip, basically all you want to do, if the player is too far to the right, you want to set it to the right of the window. And then the counter side for the left, if the player is too far left, you want to set it to zero. That's kind of all you need to do. So try to figure out how to implement this one yourself. Basically, all I want to do is if self.rect.write is greater than the window width. And if that is the case, self.rect.write should be equal to the window width. So basically, all this means if this here again is our entire window, terrible drawing, and our player is here ish. If that is the case, essentially what I want to do, I want to take this side here and place it on the right side of the window. And that way, whenever the player gets too far to the right, the player is put on the right side of the window. So it feels like the player can never leave. Although there's one more thing that we do need, we have to update this position.x as well, which just means self.post.x is going to be self.rect.x. And if we didn't do that, Pygame might get confused where these points are in relation to each other. So this position on x needs to be in the top left of the rectangle. And well, once we have that, we have to do the same thing for the other side. So self.rect.left is smaller than zero. And if that is the case, self.rect.left is going to be zero and self.post.x is going to be self.rect.x. So now I just have to call self.screenConstraint and let's see if this is working. So now the game still runs. And if I get too far to the right, 
I can't go any further. And if I go all the way to the left, this is also still working. Cool. So this one is working just fine. But now that we have that part, we can start working on the ball. And this one is going to need a couple of things. Let's talk about them. First of all, the ball needs to move around. This one is fairly easily implemented. It's going to be fairly similar compared to the player. The more complicated part is the collision, that the ball needs to be able to collide with the player and with the edges. And later on, also with all the blocks we are going to create, which means that we are going to need collisions with both static and moving obstacles which is quite a complicated topic. As a matter of fact, I have just made a whole video about it. So for this video, I am going to go over the theory in a bit, but if you want more detail, check out the other video. It's going to go over this in much more detail. And finally, the ball is also going to get an actual image, which is, well, super easy to implement, but I did want to mention it. And finally, the ball also needs to be active and passive. Now, what that basically means is that if the ball is active, it's moving around the window, and if it is passive, it's always stuck to the player. And only once the player presses a button, then the ball gets active again. And that is going to be quite a large section, so let's work on implementing all of this. Here I'm back at main.py, and I want to look at my sprites. And right now we only have player, but I want to create a second class called ball. And this one is also going to be a sprite. So pygame.sprite.sprite. And now for the init method, we need self. And then we also need to know what groups the ball should be in. But on top of that, we also need to know where the player is. Because the ball is supposed to collide with the player. So this one is going to be passed in there as well. And later on, we are going to add the obstacles as well, but for now, we don't have them. And now in here, I want my super dunder init method and pass in the groups in here as well. And now we can, let's call it a graphics setup. And all this really means is I'm going to set self.image. And self.image is going to be pygame.image.load and I'm just going to load from the string that is one fold up, graphics, other, and in there we have ball.png. And let's fix the typo and add convert underscore alpha. And that should be all we need. And besides that, I also want to have a position setup. And this one is going to be fairly similar compared to the player. Let me open it just for the init method. So we are going to need a rectangle, a direction, a position, and a speed. As a matter of fact, let me copy all of them and let me pass them in here. I guess you could be working with inheritance, but I do want to overwrite most of them anyway, so there's not much point to that. Let's go through them one by one. For the rectangle by default, Basically, what I want, if this here is my ball, I want this ball to be right on top of the player, which essentially means that the mid bottom of the ball should be in the exact same position as the top mid of the player. That is really easy to implement, but we do need to know where the player is. Let me add another section and let's call this one collision objects. And in here, all I really am going to do is self.player is going to be player, which is the argument we get from up here. And now for my rectangle, I want to place the mid bottom and the mid bottom should be in the position of player.rect.mid. And I guess the one part of this code that can stay the same is position. This one should always be the top left of the rectangle by default. The other two arguments, direction and speed, we do have to change. The ball speed I have set to 400. And for the direction, I did make some changes. And in here, we basically need X and Y. 
Now, why is the easy part? By default, this one should be negative one because the ball, once we start it, should go up. If it went down, it would be kind of weird. But for the x, I want to have a random number that is either one or negative one. So if the player starts the ball, it should go left or right randomly. And since we now have random numbers, we need from random import. In my case, I went with choice. And all I really want to do in here is choice. And into choice, we have to pass a tuple with our choices, which in my case is one and negative one. So our direction when we spawn the ball is going to be negative one in the y direction. And it is going to be either one or negative one in the x direction. The one final part for the init method is active, which really just means self.active. And by default, this one is going to be false. So now we have all we need to get started. Now to actually move the ball, we need again the update method that needs self and delta time, just like the player did. And in here, the first thing I want to do is if self.active. Then I want to, for now it's going to be pass, but this one is going to be quite a bit of stuff later on. But if the ball isn't active, so else, then I just want to set self.rect.mid bottom to self.player.rect.mid top. And don't forget self.pos also needs to be updated. And this one is just always going to be pygame.math.vector2 and self.rect.topLeft. So basically, all we are going to do in the update method for now is that the mid bottom of the ball is always going to be moved wherever the mid top of the player is. And that way, if we're moving the player, the ball is going to be moved along with it. And again, we always have to update position. Otherwise, we are going to get some weird behavior later on. And all right, this one is a good start. Let's actually see if this one is going to work. So in my main.py file, besides player, I also want to import ball. And now in our setup, I want to create another attribute called self.ball. And this one is going to be ball. And in here, let me copy the parameters. We need groups and we need our player. Groups is going to be self dot all sprites. And player is just going to be self dot player. And now let's see if this is going to work. And this one already looks pretty good. And if I move left and right, the ball is going to move along with it. So this is working just fine. Cool. And now that we have that, we can look at our ball and work on what happens when this active is going to be true. Actually, we can do this right now. In my main.py, I want to check if the player is pressing the space button. And if the player has done that, I want to set this self.active to true. And this could be a good challenge. So try to implement this one yourself, that if the player presses space, self.active should become true. All right, what I want to do in main.py. I have my event loop, and since I don't really check for that much input, I can just add another event type in here. So event.type is equal to pygame.e down. So now I am checking if any button was pressed. Inside of that, I want to check for one specific key. So if event.key is equal to pygame.e a underscore space. And if that is the case, self.ball.active should become true. Let's try. The game is still running. I can move around. But now if I press space, the ball is stuck in midair while my player keeps on moving. The reason for that is this line here. For now, we are only updating the ball position if self.active is false. If it is true, we don't do any of that, so the ball just remains constant. And in here for now, what we could be doing is self.pos plus equal self.direction 
multiplied with self dot speed and multiplied with delta time. And this is going to work, but you see in a second why this isn't a good start. So now I can move around and if I press space, nothing is happening because I forgot one line. So right now we are just setting the position. We're not actually updating this rectangle, which actually places this sprite. So we have to check self.rect.topLeft is going to be round self.post.x and round self.post.y. And I guess we can put all of this into one tuple to make it look a bit nicer. And now this should be working. So I can move around. If I now press space, the ball is just moving into space. So not particularly helpful. And the problem we have here is that there's no collision whatsoever. And this we are going to address in just a second. Although before I'm going to do that, there's another thing I would like to add. And that is that I want to normalize my direction. So this direction here. Now, what does that actually mean to normalize a vector? So right now, our direction is always going to be one or a negative one. And let's say we have a vector that moves in the direction of one purely upwards. So this is one. And then we have another vector that just moves to the right by a speed of one as well. In both of those cases, we are going to cover the same distance. The problem we have now though, is if we move both up and to the right at the same time, you would assume we are going to move at a distance of one. But that isn't actually the case. If we get both of these speeds, we are actually moving by something like 1.4. So this ball, if it moves diagonally, would move 40% faster than if it went just up or left. Which in our case isn't going to be that much of a problem because the ball is always going to move diagonally. But it still doesn't feel good to have something like this in there because it might change the speed of the ball without you intending to do so. So we do want to address it. All we really have to do is self.direction is going to be self.direction.normalize. Although this by itself is not going to work because there is a chance that this direction might be zero. In our case, again, not particularly likely, but it might be the case. And if the direction is zero, you cannot normalize it. So essentially what we want to do is if self.direction.magnitude. And if that is different from zero, then we want to normalize the direction. And the magnitude is basically the length of the vector. So if the vector has any kind of length, we want to normalize that length, meaning we always set the length of the vector to one. And that way, when we are running this code, the ball is always going to move at the same speed, which makes our game significantly more predictable. But all right, now we have to talk about the bigger part, and that is the collisions. And in my case, the ball is going to have two different kinds of collision. So let me add two methods here. We first of all have the collision by itself. And this one for now needs self and nothing else. I am just going to add pass in here. We will cover this one in a lot of detail in just a bit. But the other collision I want to add is window collision. So the collisions to make sure that the ball doesn't leave the screen. And this one we are going to do right now. And in here, what I want to do is add another parameter that is called direction. And basically what I want to do, I first want to check the direction for, let's call it horizontal. And if direction is going to be vertical, not how you spell that, then I want to do something else. Now, for this window collisions, it's not strictly necessary by itself to separate the axis. But later on for the collisions, this separation is going to become really important. So for the window collision, I already want to do the same thing. And basically what we want to do is, let me give it a bit more space. 
I first want to move the ball in the horizontal direction. So I'm either going to move it left or right. After I have done that, I'm going to check the window collisions and the normal collisions. So the collisions with the player and with the other obstacles once we have them. And only once all of that is done, I want to move the ball in the vertical direction and then do the collision and the window collision checks for this axis as well. Why that is important, you will see when we talk about the collisions, because this one is going to become a bit more complex. But for now, what I want to do is that this position shouldn't be x and y, it should just be x. And then self.direction is going to be self.direction.x, and then self.rect.x is going to be round self.post.x. And then we are going to copy all of this and replace all of the x's with y's. And that way, for now, there's not going to be any difference. But what I want to do now essentially is call self.windowcollision with horizontal and then copy this and move it here and then check for the vertical collisions. And later on, we are going to do the same thing for the normal collisions. And then you will see why the setup is going to make sense. Now we basically want to check the window collisions. And this one should actually be pretty simple in terms of collisions. So if you understand the player collisions, so the stuff we have done here, you should actually have a pretty good idea how to address the window collisions for the ball. The only difference now is that we don't set the position to the right side of the window. Instead, we just want to change the direction of the ball. And as a consequence, this could be a pretty good challenge for you. So try to implement the collisions for the ball that it bounces around the window and see how far you get. All right. Basically, let's start with the left side. So if self.rect.left is smaller than zero. So our ball is moving outside of the left side of the window. If that is the case, I want to set my self.rect.left to the position of zero. Then self.post.x should become self.rect.x. So, so far, this is the very same thing we have done here. The one thing I want to add now is self.direction.x multiply equal with negative one. So essentially what we are going to do. If the ball is moving too far to the left and is somewhere here, we want to place this side here to the left side of the window. And then instead of moving the ball further to the left, we want to change this direction to the right. And that way it looks like the ball is bouncing off the window. And now this we have to do for the other side as well. So let me copy this if statement. And now self.rect.right is greater than the window width. And if that is the case, self.rect.right should be the window width. And then this one can stay the same and this one can also stay the same. And now I have to copy all of those and do the same thing for the vertical direction. And now self.rect.top is smaller than zero. So the ball is leaving the window on the top side. And if that is the case, self.top is going to be zero and self.x should be self.y and then direction.y should also become negative one. And now we have the bottom side of the collisions. And this one we don't need at all because if the ball is touching the bottom side of the window, it should be failing. So we can remove all of this and this should be self.rect.bottom. And if this is the case, I want to set self.active to false. And now, this should be working. Let's have a look. So I can still move around. If I press space, the ball is moving around, except it doesn't collide with the top part. Let's see what went wrong. And ah, the problem here is I made a typo. This should be vertical. So now let's try this again. 
let me move to one side. This collision works, and this one works as well. And now if the ball hits the bottom part, it just disappears. Ah, and there it comes again. And let's try this again. Ah, now we have the problem that the ball, once we are restarting it, still has the downward facing direction. So that is something we do have to work on. And well, all we have to do is if we get to this point here, I want to set self.direction.y has to be negative one. Oh, and I realize this should be window height, not window width. And this should now feel a good bit better. So now let's try this. We have collisions and the ball goes straight to the player. This is feeling better. And okay, this feels quite nice. So with that, we already have some basic collisions. Although there's no collision between our ball and our player. And to implement that, we are going to need a bit of theory. So let's talk about collision theory. And there are a couple of steps we have to go through. The first one is the easiest one. And that is if there's an overlap between objects in the first place. So in our case right now, if the player and if the ball are touching at all. And this is easy because Pygame has lots of functions to do that for us. So we don't really have to worry about it. But now we have a problem and let me visualize this. So we might have a situation like this where we have the ball. So the red shape in here colliding with some kind of obstacle. And right now we just know there's an overlap. We don't know from which side the ball has come. And basically what we want to do is place this ball somewhere on the outside of the obstacle. So for example, if the ball came from the left side to the right, we want to move the right side of the ball, so this side here, to the left side of the obstacle, so that the ball is somewhere here. And that way we are resolving the overlap, so that the ball is, well, on the outside and it seems like the ball is colliding. But to achieve that, we have a problem, because if we are just looking at this, we don't know where the ball has come from. So the ball might have come from this side, the ball might have come from this side, the ball might have come from this side, the ball might have come from, well, literally any side. And well, the problem is now, unless we know where the ball came from, we cannot place the ball on the side of the collision because, well, we don't know where the ball came from. And this is something we have to figure out in code which is possibly the most complicated part of this entire tutorial. So let's talk about how we are going to achieve that. And the very first thing that we can do is to separate our axis in horizontal and the vertical axes. And this basically means that on the horizontal axis, we only have to check if the collision happened on the left or on the right. And then on the vertical, we only check if this is on the top or on the bottom. And this is going to simplify our math significantly. And basically what we are then going to do in the game is we first do all the horizontal movement, then we are checking the horizontal collision, then we are checking the vertical movement, and then we are doing the vertical collisions. And we already have the basic part of this in our code. So if I switch back to my code really quick, we have our ball class and inside of that in the update method, we are first doing all of the horizontal movement and then we are doing the vertical movement. And let me actually add comments here to illustrate this a bit better. So horizontal movement plus collision. And then I can copy all of this and change this to vertical movement plus collision. And this setup is really helpful to figure out collisions. If you didn't do this, you would have to add a whole lot more code to make all of this work which is why I included all of this. So basically what we are going to do in just a second when we are writing the collision method, we are also going to write self dot collision. And then here there should also be horizontal. And then we are doing the same thing for vertical. And let me give the collision another parameter and let's call it direction. So now we have to figure out if the collision happened on the left or on the right or on the top or the bottom. 
And now you do have to be a bit careful. So let's talk about this. Here's the case we had just now. And if you were to just look at this, you might assume that the collision definitely happened on this side here. And we would want to move the ball to this edge. Which may be right, but it's also very easy to get this wrong. Because it might have happened that the ball is moving at a very high speed in this direction. And as a consequence of the high speed, the ball might have been here on one frame, then just about here on the next frame, and then the ball jumped almost over the entire obstacle. And as a consequence, the ball is nearly over the entire thing. So just because the ball is quite far on one side of the obstacle doesn't mean the collision happened on that side. It's actually a really big problem for collisions that if the ball is moving too fast, it might literally jump over entire obstacles, which is really bad. And this problem is called tunneling in game development. It's actually a big problem. But in our case, we are not going to worry too much about it. So then how can we actually resolve this issue? And for the horizontal collisions, we have to check a left side and a right side. And both of these are going to be if statements. I'm going to only talk about the left side, but the right side works in basically the same way, except you check different numbers. If you want to check collisions on the left side, basically what we want to do we want to first check if the right side of the ball, so this side here, is greater than the left side of the obstacle, so this side here. And if the right side of the player is greater than the left side of the obstacle, we know there's going to be an overlap. So that's a really good start. But then again, the problem is we don't know where the ball came from. So in this situation, we don't know for sure that the ball came from the left, because the ball might have moved really fast from the right side. So we will need a second condition to make this work. And that second condition is going to be a check on where the ball was on the previous frame. So you can see on the screen right now, the ball in the previous frame. And what we want to check in here is if the right side of the ball is smaller than the left side of the obstacle. And if that is the case, we know that on the previous frame, so this frame here, the ball did not collide with the obstacle, but the ball was on the left side of the obstacle. And then in the current frame, so this one here, the ball is colliding on the right side. And if these two conditions are true, we know that there is a collision between these two obstacles on this side here. And this sort of logic we can then apply to the right side, to the top and to the bottom. They all work in basically the same way, except we're looking at different sides. And well, with all of that, we have our collision logic. So let's actually implement all of this. Here we are back in our code and I want to work on the collisions. And the very first thing we have to do is to find overlapping objects, which in our case right now is just a player, but we are going to get proper obstacles later on. And I want to store all of this in a separate variable. Let's call this one overlap sprites. And for now, this is just going to be a list. But later on, I want to change this to a method that captures all of the blocks the ball can collide with. But we don't have any blocks yet, so I'm just going to leave this as an empty list. But now we also want to check if the ball is colliding with the player. And this we get with if self.rect.collide rect and in here we need self.player.rect so we are essentially checking if the rectangle of the ball is colliding with the rectangle of the player collide here is not the perfect word overlap would be better because we only check an overlap we don't really check a collision although i guess those two are very similar if that is the case i want to get my overlap sprites and append self.player so essentially later on, these overlap sprites are going to be all the blocks the ball is colliding with. And if the ball is also colliding with the player, we want to add the player to this list as well. Once we have this method here properly, this is going to make much more sense. So right now, if the ball is colliding with the player, we have a list with one sprite inside. And now we want to check if overlap sprites exists in the first place. So if there's anything inside of this list. 
Then we first of all want to check our direction. So if our direction is horizontal, then we want to do something. And if direction is vertical, then we want to do something else. And let's work on the horizontal side for now. Basically what we want to do for sprite in overlap sprites, we are looking at every single sprite inside of that list. And now we have to implement the logic I just talked about. So let's start with a collision on the left side of the obstacle. Basically what we want to do in here is if self.rect.right is greater or equal than sprite.rect.left. And this is now our current frame. So let me draw this. We have our obstacle something like this. And we have a ball that might be on this position here right now. And what we are checking in this line right now is if the right side of the ball, so this side here, is greater than the left side of the obstacle. So this side here. And that is a really good start, but this doesn't help us right now because the ball might have come from this side, which again, we couldn't really account for right now. So we have to add a second condition with and. And basically what I would like to get in here is self.oldRect.right is smaller or equal than sprite.oldRect.left. And let me draw what this means. I guess I can reopen the previous drawing. So right now we already covered the first if statement. This one just checks if the right side of the ball is greater than the left side of the obstacle, which is a good start. Let me get rid of the lines so it's a bit easier to see. So now we know that this condition here works out. What we now want to check if on the previous frame the ball was something like here. So at the right side of the ball is smaller than the left side of the obstacle, which is this if statement here. The issue we are facing right now is that we don't have an old rectangle for either the ball or any of the obstacles. So we have to create these attributes. And that fortunately isn't as difficult as it sounds. So basically what we have to do, let's start with the ball by itself. When I initiate this class, I have my rectangle. And what I also want to create is self dot old underscore rect. And this one, for now, it's just going to be self.rect.copy. So for now, we are literally just copying the rectangle. So that isn't going to help us very much, but it's a start. And now what I essentially want to do in my update method, before I do any of the movement, I want to create old rectangle. And all that really means is self.oldRect is going to be self.rect.copy again. Now, what do we actually do? And think of it like this. When we come down here, so in the execution of our code, we have our rectangle and it might be, let's say in this position here with some X and Y position. It doesn't really matter which they are. And when we come to this line here, we are making a copy of this rectangle. So now these two rectangles are in the same position. But what we now do in all of these lines on the code, we are moving this original rectangle. So let me draw an arrow. So this rectangle here is being moved in any kind of direction. We don't really care in which direction it is being moved. It just doesn't matter to us. But now this rectangle here isn't being moved. And as a consequence, this rectangle stays on the previous frame, whereas this rectangle here moves to the next frame. And with that, we have a previous and we have a current frame, with the old rect being our previous one. And that's really all the logic you are going to need in here. And now this line, we can copy for the player and implement it in there as well. So here I have the player. And after I've created the rectangle, let me just copy it in here. I now have an old rectangle. And then in the update method, we again, before we do anything else, have to create self.rect. And this is going to be self.rect.copy. 
and this should be not wrecked but old wrecked. And now, before we move anything, we are making a copy of the rectangle, then we are moving the rectangle. So now we have a previous frame and our current frame at the end of all of this. So with that, we have our current and our previous frame, which is all we need for this line here to work. And now that we do have that, we can implement some logic. So basically what I want to do for the ball is self.rect.write, is going to be equal to sprite.rect.left. And this basically means if this here is our obstacle and our ball collided with something like this, we want to move the ball to this side here. So that our ball is now here. And that way it looks like the ball didn't overlap but just collide. And since we now move the rectangle, we also have to move the position. So self.post.x is going to be self.rect.x. And now finally, what we have to do is self.direction.x multiply equal with negative one, because we want to bounce the ball as well. And well, with that, we have the collision for one side. All we have to do now is copy this three more times and get the other collisions as well. And this, I think, could be a really good challenge for you. So try to implement the collision for the left side, the top and the bottom, and see how far you get. Let me start with the other side by just copying this if statement. And essentially what I want to check now is if self.rect.left is smaller or equal than sprite.rect.right. And if I draw this one, I think that's the best way to think about it, we have our obstacle here. And now we want to check if the ball collision happened on this side here. So what we check right now is the left side of the ball against the right side of the obstacle. And if the ball is smaller than that, we know there happened a collision. And besides that, we now want to check if the old rectangle of the ball, so left side, was greater or equal than the right side of the obstacle. And then we have to check self.rect.left is going to be sprite.rect.right. And the other two lines can stay just the same. With that, we have the horizontal collisions. So now I can copy all of this and paste it into the vertical axis as well. And in here, let's start with the bottom. So if the bottom of the ball is greater or equal than the top of the obstacle, and then besides that, we also want to check if the bottom of the player in the previous frame was above the obstacle. And now if that is the case, sprite.rect.bottom should be equal to sprite.rect.top. And the only thing we now have to change in the other two lines is going to be y instead of x. And nearly done. Now we want to check if self.rect.top is smaller or equal than sprite.rect.bottom. And we basically just change left to top and right to bottom. So this should be top as well. And this should be bottom. And now again, this x should be a y. And with that, we should be done. Let's try. So now these collisions still work and this is also working, nice. And now the important part is if there's collision on the left side of a player, this one is important. So let's try this again. The ball may be a little bit slow, but okay, it's kind of hard to get, but I want to hit the right side. Okay, well, the collisions do work. And the really important part here, why we need specific collision mechanics is that when there's a collision between the ball and the player on the right or the left side. In this case, it's totally possible that the player is moving to the right and the ball is moving to the left. And if we don't have a collision, this collision mechanic is still going to work. We don't get some weird error that the ball is just moving around randomly, which is what I really cared about in here. But all right, now with all of that, 
we have a working collision mechanic, which took quite some time. Let me minimize this method because it is quite massive. All right, so with that, we can come to the next section. And that is going to be creating the obstacles. And for now, there are two things I would like to work on. Number one is that I want to have some kind of layout that shows me where the blocks are going to be. And besides that, when we actually create the blocks in the method, these blocks should scale automatically to the size of the window. So that we don't create blocks that are either massively too small or massively too large if the size of the window changes. So when we are creating the blocks from the layout, there should be some flexibility in terms of how large the blocks are going to become. And for now, all of the blocks are going to be a simple color. But later on, we are going to add proper graphics. I just want to focus on specific things for now. But all right, let's jump straight into the code and let's work on this. Here we are back in the code. And first of all, I want to go to my settings. And right now, there really isn't very much in here. But I want to add something else. And that is going to be what I called a block map. And this one is essentially a list that contains a couple of strings, and that's just about it. And basically what this one means here, if we have a one, for example, we are creating a block with this type one, and then this block is going to have a certain amount of health and a certain color. As a matter of fact, I do have a color legend as well. This one looks like this. So for example, if we have a one here, we want to look at our color legend, pick up the one here, and from that we know this color is supposed to be blue. And then this number is also going to be the amount of health for this block. So this layout basically tells us three bits of information. The position of the block, the color of the block, and the amount of health the block has. And you can totally change this kind of layout. For example, in my case, I didn't even add gray blocks. So for example, I could add seven and seven in here, and we will get some gray blocks later on. You will see in a second how this thing is going to work. And now before we can actually place these blocks, we need a few more bits of information. And I'm gonna add these as extra constants. The first is the gap size, spelled correctly. And in my case, this is two. And this gap size refers to the gap between the blocks. So if we have a block here and another block here, Gap size refers to the distance between these two. And now that we have that information, we can already figure out the block height and we can figure out the block width. And there's one thing I did forgot to mention. In this block map, we have a couple of strings that are just empty or well, they're not empty, but they have spaces inside. And for these, I just don't want to have any block in them. I think that's fairly obvious. Okay, now, for the block height, basically what I want to do. Here I have my entire window and the height for this window we get from the 720 here. So I know the height of this window is 720 pixels. And I know inside of this window, I have a couple of rows because each string inside of this list is supposed to be one row. And for simplicity, let's say I have 10 strings inside of this block map, which means in this window, I am going to have 10 rows. So one, two, three, four, and you get the idea. And now what we basically want to figure out is how tall does each row need to be? And the math here is actually super simple. All we really have to do is divide the entire height of the window by the amount of rows that we have. So in this case, for example, we know the height of one of the rows would be 72. Although this isn't the final number, because from the 72, we would want to subtract the gap size. So this two in our case. Essentially, what we want to do is the entire height of the window divided by the number of rows minus the gap size which in our case would be 72 minus two, which would be 70 pixels. And this 70 pixels in this case would then be the height of one individual block. Once we have that, we can do the same logic for the width of the window and that way we will get the width of each individual block. 
And well, I think this could become a really interesting challenge. So with all of this in mind, try to figure out the code for the block height and the block width and see how far you get. For the block height, basically what we want to do is window height divided by the length of block map. And the length of the block map basically tells us how many strings we have in here, which is exactly what we need. And from that, we just have to subtract the gap size and we are good to go. This is all we really needed. And now for the block width, we can do the same thing, except now it's going to be width. And now for the length. We don't just want to look at block map, but we know that the length of each of these lists tell us how many columns we have. So in this case, let's say there are 15 numbers inside of this. And since there are 15 numbers in here, we know we are supposed to have 15 columns inside of this block map. So all we really want to do in here is not look at block map, but look at one string inside of block map. And let's say the first one, so this one here. And that is all we needed again. So now I can subtract gap size again, and we are done. So with that, we have a gap size, the block size for the width and the height. Now what we have to do next. In main.py, we have to create another method. And let's call this one stage set up. That is not how you spell that. And in here, we just need self and nothing else. And what we now want to do, we want to first of all cycle through all rows and columns of log map. And once we have that, we want to find the X and Y position for each individual block. So essentially what that means, we want to cycle through this thing. We first want to cycle through all of the rows, so all of the strings, and that will be giving us the Y position. And then inside of that, and then inside of that, we want to cycle through every single number inside of the string, and that would be giving us the X position. And basically what that means, I first want to go for row in block underscore map, I think I called it. And let's just print row and see what we get. Obviously, don't forget to actually call this method, which I have done in the setup method. So in here, self.stage setup. And let's see what we get. So now we still get our window, but we don't care about it. What we instead care about is this here. So in here, we have all of our strings inside of block map, which is a pretty good start. But there's one important thing we now need to figure out, because right now I don't really care what is inside of the string. I instead want to know what the index of this string here is. So what I essentially want to know is that this first string here has the index zero, then the second one has index one, then two, three, and so on. And then what I'm going to do in a second is multiply this number with the block height of each of the blocks. And that way, the first block is going to start in position zero on the Y axis. The one with the index one is going to start on something like 70 pixels. The next one multiplied by height is on 140 and so on. So this index here is going to become really important. And that index we can get with the enumerate method. So in here, enumerate. And enumerate is going to return the information, so the row. But before that, it's going to return an index, which I want to capture in index row. Actually, I think row index is making more sense. So now I can copy this line. And let's change the first one to row index. And now let's see what we get. So let me close the window again. Now we know on index number zero, we get this information. On row number one, we get this information and so on. And actually from that, we can already get the Y position. So basically what I want to do is I want to get the row index and multiply this with the block 
height. And the block height is just what we got down here. So this would be a good start. And let's actually print what we get. So print y. Now if we run this again, we are getting 0, 78, 156, and so on. And this is a reasonable y position, but we are missing something really important, and that is the gap size. So what I basically want to do is this block height is going to get the gap size as well. And now if I run this, we're getting 0, 80, 160, and we know the block height is going to be 78. So there's one pixel of a gap between the top and the bottom. Although there is going to be another problem we have to deal with. Because this 80 right now, let me minimize the game. So essentially what we have right now is here we have a couple of rows. Let me add one on top. And the first row is 0, the second one is 80, and the third one is 160. This I got from the information down here. And we also know that inside of this, we have our blocks that should be 78 pixels tall. And that is the information we calculated inside of block height. Now, the problem is that if we were to just use this information here, we would always place the block in the top part of this row, which essentially means that we have no offset on the top and we have two pixels right now offset at the bottom, which is the entire size of our gap. So what we instead want to do is to place this block in the middle of the row. So we have one pixel on the top and one pixel at the bottom, or always half of the gap size. And to achieve that, let me clean this one up a tiny bit. Basically, all we want to do is towards this Y position, I want to add gap, underscore size and floor divide this by two. And that way we are not adding the top part exactly on the top row. Instead, we are giving it half the gap off size. And then at the bottom, automatically, we are already getting half of the gap size again. So I hope this makes sense. All right, so with that, we have the Y position. To get the X position, we essentially have to cycle through each of the individual strings. And this is going to happen in a very similar way compared to the Y position. So really, all we have to do is for, let's add a call index and a column. In, enumerate, and now importantly, we want to enumerate over the row, so this one here. And inside of this, we have to indent our Y, and now we can also get our X position. And for the X position, we are basically getting the column index. We are going to multiply it with the block width plus the gap size. And then towards that, we are adding gap size again, except in half. And with that, we have our X and our Y position. So I guess I can move this one up a tiny bit. Now this looks better. And now that we have that, I want to use that information to create a block. And this block we don't have yet, so we have to create it. But there are a few bits of information I would like to pass in here. First of all, I want to get some type of a block, which basically means the type is each of these numbers. So a type of a block could be six, it could be seven, three, two, one, doesn't really matter. I also just realized there's no five in here. Let me add five on these sides. So that's the first thing I need. Next up, I need a position. And that's going to be the X and the Y we created here. And let me move the X up so it feels a bit better. Okay, so X and Y is going to be our position. And then we are going to need some groups. And that is, at least for now, all we are going to need. So. Let me copy all of this, comment it out, and now in my sprites, I want to create another class. And this one I called lock. And this one again has to be pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. And in here, for the dunder init method, I want to pass in the arguments I just talked about. 
Although, don't forget, we also need self. And usually I avoid type because it might interfere with the inbuilt Python method type. So let's change this to block underscore type. But all right, now that we have that, we as always need a super dunder init method that is going to get our groups. Besides that, I am going to need a self.image and self.rect. And self.image is really easy, at least I hope it is. All we need is pygame.surface. And we know how large each of the blocks needs to be. That's the information we have here with block height and block width. So let me just copy them, block height and block width. And the rectangle is just going to be self.image.get underscore rect. And top left is going to be the position we are getting from up here. And this by itself for now is all we need to get started. Now, let me uncomment the block. The type we are getting from the column. So the column is basically going to be each of these numbers. So that's what we have to pass in for the type. The position is going to be a tuple with X and Y. And for now, for the groups, I want this to be in self dot all sprites. And now let's try this. We're getting an error because I did not import the block. So lock and now let's try this again. And there we go. We are getting something weird. And the problem here is that right now we are checking for literally any kind of string. So even if the string is empty, iGame is still going to place a block there, which we don't want. So I'm going to add all of this inside of an if statement. And that is if the column is different from an empty string. And only if that's the case, I want to place all of these blocks. All right, and now if we run the code, this is looking better, although still kind of weird. The gap besides each of those blocks is way too large. And let's have a look at the sprites. I think I know what the issue is. Ah, the issue is here. I switched around the height and the width. So the first argument for surface is the width, and the second one is the height. So now let's try this again. And this is looking significantly better. So with that, we have our blocks. And what we are now able to do is to create another sprite group. And this one, let's call it block underscore sprites. And this one again, is just going to be pygame.sprite.group. And now when I create this block, it's going to be in all sprites and it's also going to be in self.block sprites. And now the ball needs to know where these block sprites are. So when we are creating the ball, I want to do the stage setup first. And then inside of the ball, I am going to pass in self.block sprites. And now in my sprites, I can get my ball and, and add another parameter. Let's call it the blocks. And now self.blocks is going to be blocks. So we have an attribute with all of the blocks. And now the important bit. In these overlap sprites, we can use pygame.sprite.sprite collide. And in here, we need a sprite, a group, and do kill. The sprite is just the sprite we want to look at which in our case is going to be self. Then we have a group, which in our case is going to be all of the blocks. So self.locks, I think I called it. Uh, yeah, this one here. And finally, do kill. And that's just asking us, do we want to destroy the block if it touches the ball, which in our case is false. And that is all we need for all the collision mechanics. So now let's try this. And ah, now we're getting an error that block does not have an attribute old rectangle. So when we run the collisions, we are checking for an old rectangle, which our blocks don't have right now. So we have to give it to them. 
And this one is just self old rect is going to be self dot rect dot copy. And now let's try this again. And we get some basic collisions. Although you can see sometimes there's a bit of an issue here where the ball seems to stick around the blocks. And this I'm going to work on just a second. I just want to show it again. I hope it comes up. Um, I guess not. Okay, never mind. But essentially the problem we have right now is let me open up the collision for the ball. The vertical one in particular. Let me add a bit more space. The issue we have right now. Imagine we have two blocks here and the ball is colliding with both like this. So we have a collision here and we have a collision here. And the result is that this self dot direction is going to be multiplied with negative one twice, once for this block and once for this block. And as a consequence, the ball first goes down and then goes up again, which means that for a second, the ball is hovering around it, which really isn't what we want. And what I found that solves this issue entirely is instead of spawning the bottom of the player on the top, for example, or the top of the player at the bottom of the sprite, we want to give an offset of one pixel. So we want to add plus one here and minus one here, and then negative one here and plus one here. That way, after a collision, the ball is going to be moved one pixel up or one pixel down, so we don't have another collision straight afterwards. So now let's try this again. There shouldn't be any visible difference, except we don't have the bug anymore. Um, okay, I am terrible at my own game. Okay, this feels kind of nice. Okay, I am really bad at this game. Okay, I think this is looking pretty good. Cool. Now, obviously, now obviously this game doesn't do anything right now. So in our blocks, we have to add a bit more code that blocks get destroyed once the ball is touching them, or at least they lose some health. And for that, let me add another section here. And that is going to be damage information, I guess is the word. And first of all, I want self.health in here. And that is just going to be an integer of the block type. Because remember, the block type is literally just a number. So we can totally use it for the health. Now that we have that, I want to give this block a method that I called get underscore damage. And in here, we need self and we need an amount. So how much damage the ball can get. And essentially, all we want to do in here is self.health minus equal the amount of damage taken. And now, obviously, we have to update this rectangle. So what I basically want to check is if self.health is greater than zero, I want to update the image, which we can't do yet. So I'm just going to add pass in here. But if that is not the case, and this should be health, if our health is equal to or lower than zero, I want to destroy this sprite with the kill method. And now all we have to do, if the ball is colliding with this block, we want to call the get damage method and pass in an amount of damage. Now in my case, the damage is always going to be one, but you could totally add another number in here. So what we have to do in the ball, we are checking for the collisions. That is going to happen in here. And first of all, I have to identify that we have a block because if the ball is colliding with the player, there should just be a collision and nothing else. And how I can identify the blocks is that blocks have a health attribute. So I can use if get utter, which is checking a class, which in my case is sprite. And then we can pass in one attribute we would like to check, which in my case is health. And if that sprite doesn't have this attribute, I want to just return none. So this line basically checks if the sprite we have has the health attribute, which in our case is only the blocks. And if that is the case, sprite.getDamage should be called with a damage of one. 
And now I have to copy all of this for the vertical axis as well. And now we should be having a working code. Let's try. So now the block disappears. I'm still terrible at this game. So now we had two. This is working. We are definitely making some progress. I'm hoping to hit the second row as well eventually. There we go. Now nothing changed, but now it did. This was actually perfect. So the second row has more health than the first one. And as a consequence, we have to hit them twice instead of once. And there we go. Now you can see it again. The logic here is definitely working. And so are the collisions. This is working very nicely. Cool. So with all of that, we have our collision mechanics and our blocks. So with that, we can start working on the next section. And that is going to be about adding proper graphics. So in this part, we are actually going to make our game look better. But we do have a problem here. Let's talk about what we have to address. And let's have a look at one image to understand what's going on. So here you can see one individual block. And I have brightened up the entire scene so it's a bit easier to see what's going on. And right now, this block by itself is totally fine. Now, the issue that we have is that this block needs to look good in literally any kind of size. So for example, it would need to look good like this, like this, like this, like this. And in our case right now, especially if you squash this a bit more, it starts to look really weird. It might look okay like this, but we can't guarantee it's always looking like this. And especially if we have a case like that, it starts to look really, really bad. So the issue that we have is that if we just took an image and scaled it up to whatever we need, we might squish it or stretch it in such a way that it might end up looking weird. So we need to do something else. And what we are going to do instead is this. Let me return to the darker background. This white background is what we want to create. And again, here, the aspect ratio is really important. That this thing should be able to scale in any size and any proportion that we want, within reason, I suppose. And as a consequence, we couldn't just scale a random image. So what we are going to do instead is this. We are going to just create the edges. So each of these corners is going to be a separate background. And these cannot stretch. They will always have the same size. But then we are going to blit some more surfaces, these yellow ones. The difference for this one, though, is that these yellow rectangles can stretch. And as a consequence, it doesn't really matter how big the surface is going to become because this white surface is going to become wider or shorter depending on how big it needs to be. And then in the end, we're just going to fill the entire thing with a color and we are basically done with it. And all right, I think all of that might be slightly difficult to understand. So let's try to explain this in a different way. Here we can see one block that we might actually see in the game. And this thing right now might look like one coherent image. But in reality, it actually isn't. I can, for example, take the top left away. I can take the bottom left away. I can take the left away. It all works just fine. And the trick now is... Let's say I have this block, but I want this block to be bigger. And now the trick is, let's say I want to expand the size of this thing on the horizontal axis. So I want, let's say, the top left to be here and the top right to be here. And they do have to be on the same height. That is really important. Basically, if I have this now, I can take the middle part and this one is supposed to scale in the X axis. And if I scale it like this, then we have, well, a properly working setup. So the top left and the top right don't scale, but the middle part does scale. And since the middle part can scale without any loss in quality, this system works really well. And this is essentially what we are going to implement in our game. So I hope that is going to make more sense. In our game folder, we have blocks, and inside of blocks, we have a couple of different colors and the player. 
And let me open the blue one. So inside of the blue folder, we have just a bunch of very small images. And this is essentially what we are going to import. And then we're going to use these individual images to create the actual surface for the player or for all of the blocks. And if we use that system, we have blocks that scale in basically any dimension. So I think if we implement this, all of this is going to make much more sense. So let's go straight into the code and let's have a look at this. Here I am back in my code. And what I want to do is to create a new file. And this one, I am going to save as surfacemaker.py. And in here, I am going to create a class. So class surface maker. And this M should be capitalized. And what this thing is essentially supposed to do, let me add a comment. It is supposed to import all the graphics and it is supposed to create one surface with the graphics with any size. And finally, it is supposed to return that image to the blocks or the layer. And that's basically all we want to do in here. Now, for that to work, we need a couple of different things. First of all, we need to import Pygame for the obvious reasons. And besides that, we need from settings, import star. And just to test that this thing is working, I want to, for now, give it one method that I'm going to call get surface. And this one itself, we want a block type so we know what color we get and we need a size. And now all we are really going to do is image is going to be pygame.surface and it's going to create a surface with a certain size. And for now, this image we are going to fill, let's say for now, with a red color. And once we have that, we want to return that image. Now, this surface maker, I now want to import into my game class. So in my main file, I need from surface maker import surface maker. And now as a first thing in the setup, I want to create an instance of this surface maker. So self.surface maker is going to be surface maker. And now the player is going to get an instance of this self.surface maker. And when we create a stage, so all the way down here, each of the blocks is also going to get an instance of self.surface maker. And now you might be asking yourself, why don't we just create an instance of the surface maker inside of player and inside of each of the block when we create a class itself? Why do we import this straight in the game method? The reason here is that surface maker in a second is going to import a lot of images. So it's going to import each part of each of the blocks. And right now we are doing this once. But if we were to create a separate instance of this method for each player and each block, we would import significantly more images. And as a consequence, I'm going to import it here and make it available to all of my classes that need it. All right, now in my sprites, let's start this with the player. Now the player, first of all, is going to need another parameter. So surface maker. And let's put this straight in the setup part. So self dot surface maker is going to be surface maker. And now essentially what we can do, instead of getting a random surface here, I want to do something else. I want to do surface maker and then call this get surface method here. So surface maker dot get surface. And in here, we are going to need a block type and a size. So let me copy the parameters. And now for the block type, for now, we are just going to say player, so we know what's going on. And for the block type, for now, we are just going to say a string of player. And the size we still have. I still have it in my notes for this. Let me just copy it. So the size is just going to be 10% of the window width and 5% of the window height. And now 
our surface maker is going to create a surface for the player. And this is what we actually want to do. Now, before we can test this, we have to do the same thing for the blocks. So now for the blocks, they're going to need another parameter called surface maker. And before we are creating an image, I want to set self.surfacemaker is going to be surface maker. And then let me copy out block width and block height. So I save a bit of writing. And in here, all I want to do is self.surfacemaker.get underscore surface. And in here, I want to have my dimensions. And for the block type, I already have my block type. So what we would expect now is that we can see some red rectangles, but the size should still work. And we are getting an error that I believe I forgot a bracket. So now let's try this again. And now we can see all of our surfaces are red. Not exactly helpful right now, but something we can work with. Now we can work inside of this surface maker and actually create the graphics. And the first thing we have to do in here is to import all of the surfaces. So this is going to happen in the init method. And this one needs self and nothing else. And since we need access to the folder, we actually need to import another module. And this one is from OS import walk. And all that walk really does is it walks through a couple of folders in our operating system. And I can actually show you what's going to happen. So what we can do, for example, is for info in walk. And now we need the path to our graphics folders, which in my case is this one here. So we go up one folder to graphics and then to blocks. And now if I print this information, so print info. And now if I run all of this, we again can see our game. And now in the bottom part, we have a ton of data. So let's talk through it. Essentially, we get two bits of information. So this first list we get here is kind of different from the other lists. Um, let me actually explain. Essentially, what walk does, it looks inside of a folder and it returns a couple of things. The first bit of information we get is the folder path, which is what we already have, so we don't really care about it. Then we get all of the subfolders. So in my case, we have blue, bronze, green, gray, and so on. These are all of the folders inside of that main folder. And then we have a third list. And this one would contain all of the data besides the folders. So any kind of image would be in here. Now, this would be our first list. But what walk also does is it goes through every single subfolder inside of this folder and then gives us information on that as well. For example, here is the second list we get. And in there, we are looking at the blue folder. And inside of the blue folder, there are no subfolders. So this list is empty, but we have a ton of images. So now we have bottom PNG, bottom left PNG, bottom right PNG, and so on. And this is the information I can use to import all of the data that I need. Although we do have a problem here, that the structure of this list is inconsistent, meaning that it changes after the first item. So the first item here is kind of different from the rest of the list. So we have to be very careful when working with this. Essentially, the first thing I want to do is I have to identify the first element inside of the list being returned from walk. And the easiest way to do this is to use the enumerate method. And with that one, we get index and we get info. And now what I can do is if index is equal to zero. So if we are on the first list, what I can do with this information is to create a dictionary. And then this dictionary is going to hold all of the data. So let me actually implement this. I want to call this self.assets. And self.assets is going to be a dictionary comprehension. So I want to create a color key with another dictionary inside of it. And this for color in info and index number one. So info one is just the name of all of the folders. And let me actually print again the information 
that should make it a bit easier to understand what we are doing. Here we have all of our data again. And right now I am exclusively looking at the first list. And in here, the graphics part, we are just going to ignore. But info one is this list here. And really all I am going to do is I'm going to cycle through every single item inside of this list and turn every single color into a key for a dictionary. And then this key is going to be associated with another dictionary that for now is going to be empty. So if I print self.assets as well and run all of this again, we again get our game that we don't care about. We now have, after the first item, another dictionary that just says blue empty dictionary, bronze empty dictionary, green empty dictionary, and so on. And this is now going to be the structure for how we are going to store our data. What that means in practice. If the index is greater than zero, so I can just add an else statement. I want to go for image name in info and two. So info two are going to be all of the names of our files. And this is what I want to look through. And now I want to create a full path. So this could, for example, be the full path to the top left inside of the blue folder or the top part or the right part. And for that to work, we need a few things first. First of all, I need to figure out my color type. So do we have a blue piece right now? Do we have a bronze piece or a green piece? And this we get with self.assets.keys. And essentially in here, I want to take the index minus one. And index minus one is going to be cause we are essentially skipping index zero and then our first item inside of assets is going to have the index with zero. And all of this, I want to turn into a list. And now that we have that, I can just copy my graphics blocks. I can add the color type. And now we need something else for the color type because this has to be inside of an F string for the simple reason that we do need the slashes. If we don't have those, the whole thing is not going to work. And finally, we need image name. And now this path here is going to be the full path to every single graphic inside of our graphics folder. But let me just print what we actually get. So if I now run all of this again, we are getting an error because the list Let me get rid of the error message. So we don't want to turn this entire thing into a list. We want to turn only the keys into a list. So then we can use indexing. So now let's try this again. There we go. Essentially what we have created now is let's say inside of this one here, we have the player and we get each of the graphics inside of the player folder. And this one is just going to be a string. And that is what we wanted to import. And this is going to happen for all of the folders. So we have purple, for example, we have red, for example, and this continues. And let me get rid of the print statements. They are getting a bit annoying. Okay, cool. So now what we essentially have is a full path to each of the file we care about. We can use that information now to just import all of these images. And this happens with pygame.image.load. We want to get the full path. And then don't forget to convert alpha, all of this. And now we have to attach this surface to the assets dictionary. And this is going to happen with self.assets. And in here, I want to get the specific color type. And this is then going to be another dictionary. And inside of this dictionary, I want to create another key. And this key is going to be image name dot split. And what we want to split is at a dot. And then we only want to get the first index. And then this is going to get the value of our surface. Now, what does this line mean? And I think this is best explained if I actually print self dot 
assets and let's see what we get. So if I now print all of this, we are getting a lot of information. But basically, let's look at the first one. So we have blue here and blue extends all the way to here. So let me go to Surface Maker and we are looking just at the first dictionary. And this self.blue, we are getting with self.assets and the color type. And now inside of this dictionary, we get image name dot split at a period, and then we get the first part of this index. And essentially what that did is that for the first surface here, for example, the original name was bottom.png. And what this image name dot split did is remove the PNG at the end of this bottom so that we don't have to work with the file extensions. We just get the name of the file. And once we had that, we set the surface to the value of this dictionary. And this we have done many, many times over. So again, these lines really not that simple anymore. I would recommend to go over them a couple of times if you're confused, but this is actually all I needed. And with that, we have actually already covered the first part that we imported all of the graphics. And I guess we also covered the final part that we want to return the final image. So the last thing that we do have to do is to create a surface with the graphics that covers basically any size. And for that, we are going to need a bit of space. First of all, I do not want to fill the image we already have with a color. So let me just remove it for now. And now we have to blit essentially nine different things. We need the four corners, we need the four sides, and we need the center color. So let's start with one and let's see how far we get. And before we can start on the corners, we first need to know what color we are working with. And this I want to do all the way at the top. And for this one, I created sides. And sides is just going to be self.assets. And then we are going to get the block type. So the block type in this case would be blue or green or bronze. It really doesn't matter for now what we are going to get. And for now, we don't really work with this too well. So for the image right now, we are just getting the block type. So let's say for now, we are just going to change this to red. And for the player, I think it already said player. Yeah, so this player already works. And now we can actually start using that. This section, I think, is getting really hard. Um, I hope it still makes sense. But essentially, all we want to do now is image.blit. And we want to get sides. And the side we want to get in here is top left. And the position where we want to place it is zero and zero. And now let's see what's going to happen. This is looking much more interesting. So now we get the top left for each of the blocks. We should also be seeing something for the player. Let's actually have a look. And if I look at my sprites and in the player, the problem here is that after I created the image with Surface Maker, I'm filling all of this with a red color. So let me get rid of this one. And now let's try this again. And this one is looking better. You can also see the top left of my player. And now let's do the top right. So image.blit, sides. And now I want to get the top right. But now I need a position. Or more specifically, I need X and Y. Now Y is kind of easy because the top right should be at the top. So this one can just be zero. The left side is going to be a bit more difficult though. So let me draw what I am going to do. Here is the surface we are going to create. And the individual part I want to place right now should be in the top left. And now I need an X and a Y position. Now the Y position can just be zero because it's supposed to be right on the top part. But now for the X, essentially what I want to do, I want to get the entire width of the main surface. Let's call this W. And from that, I want to subtract the width 
of my smaller part. Let's call it uh, W2. So all I really have to do is get my W minus my W2. And that way I would get to this point here, which would be the left side of this part, which is exactly what I care about. So all I really want is to get size, which is what I get up here. And in there, I want to get the first element, which is my entire width. And from that, I want to subtract this surface here and then dot get underscore width. And let me remove all of this so it's a bit easier to read. So this is the entire size of our surface, of the main surface, and this is the width of the corner part. So this should be working. Let's try. And there we go. Now we have the top left and the top right for both the blocks and our player. Let's now do the top middle part. And this one I want to have in the sides. And now I don't just want to look at all the four sides. Let's do this a bit more methodically. I just want to look at the top side. And then here we need a few bits that are important. Since we want to scale the top part, I need to know how wide this thing has to be. So top width. Once we have that information, I want to get something like scaled top surface. And this we get in a second. And once we have that, I just want to image dot blit, then the scaled top surface. And now we need an X and a Y position. Now for Y, we already know this is going to be zero. The X we are going to figure out in just a second. But let's start working on the top width. And here again, I think it's best to draw all of this out. So here we have the entire width of our main surface. So this is this image here. And on that surface, I already have a top left and a top right. So essentially what I'm trying to find is this distance here. And well, if you look at it like this, this should be fairly simple. All we really have to do is get this entire width and from that subtract this size and this size. And that way we are left with the part we actually care about. And in practice, what that means, we again want to get size zero. So that's the entire width of the window. And from that, we want to subtract sides. And in here, we have top left. And from that, I want to get underscore width. And this, I want to add two sides. And we want to get the top right. And this one also needs to get, get width. And with that, we have the width we are going to need. So now we have to use that information to scale that surface. And this we are going to do with pygame.transform.scale. And in here, we need a surface and then a new width and a new height. Now the surface is kind of easy because we have sides and top. And the width is going to be top width. Now the height, I don't want to change. So this one is just going to be sides and top and then get underscore height. So with that, we have our scaled top surface. Now all we have to figure out where to place this. And if you again look at this graphic, it should be fairly simple. We essentially want to put this top surface on the right side of the top left. So all we really have to do, let me copy it from here, we need to get the width of the top left. And if I paste this in here, we should be good to go. Let's try this. And there we go. Now we have the top part. Let me remove all the drawings. This is not looking bad at all. And essentially now we have the basic system to make all of this work. The rest of this entire system is just replicating all of this a couple more times. So we need two more corners, bottom left and bottom right. And then we need left, right and bottom for the sides. And then we also need the center. And I think this could be a really interesting challenge. So to make sure you understand the system, 
try to implement this yourself and see how far you get. I do understand this entire system is quite complex. So if you have to go over it a couple of times, I would really recommend to do this if you're not sure about what you are doing. It is, well, a bit more advanced. So try as far as you can get. I guess we can finish the corners first. So we already have top left and top right. Next up, we need bottom left and bottom right. So image dot blit. Again, I want the sides. And now let's go with bottom left. And here again, we are going to need X and Y. Now, in this case, X is going to be the easier one because the bottom left should be on the left side. And now we have to figure out the top part of this side. And this we get with size one. And from that, I want to subtract sides bottom left. And I just realized I forgot a bracket. So sides bottom left. And from this one, we want to get the height. And let's try this one. We got an error because probably some kind of bracket didn't work out. I think it's this one. Let's try. This one looks better. All right. So now we have the top left for all of our surfaces. Now, finally, we are going to need the bottom right. And for that, I am just going to copy the bottom left and change this one to bottom right. Now, for this one, the top part, so the Y position, already works. We just have to figure out the X aspect. And this one we kind of already have, because this one we essentially did when this line here. So size zero, let me paste it in here. So size zero minus sides, this one should be bottom right, and then get width, and then the other side, and this one should be all we need. Let's try this one, and there we go. Now we have all of the corners. So that is a really good start. Next up, we need the left side, we need the right side, and we need the bottom side. And this is all going to work very similar compared to what we have done here. So I'm just going to copy this one and let's work with it. So instead of top width, it should be, let's call it left height. And in here, we don't want the width of the entire thing, we want the height. And from that, we want to subtract two things. The top left is still fine, but now we also want the bottom left. And now we don't want to get the width, we want to get the height. And this should be done for both of them. So with that, we have the entire height that we need. Next up, I want to get the scaled left surface. Highgam.transform.scale still works. Then I want sides, this one should be left. And now for the scaling, I need a new W and a new height. The height we just got, that is going to be the left height. Now width is the easier part. All we are going to need in here is sides left, I think I called it. And from that, we need get underscore width and we should be good to go. Now, finally, we need the scaled left surface. This one should just be left. As a matter of fact, we want to put this on the left side. So this one should be zero. And now we have to figure out the top part of this surface. And this one we get with sides. And this one is going to be top left. And now get underscore height. And let's try this one. And this one is also working just fine. Cool. Two more sides and then we are basically done with this one. So now we have the right side. And for this one, we can actually copy the left side and this should be a good bit easier. So now we want to get the right height. 
dice.1 still works. And now we want the top right get height, and this one should be bottom right. And get height still works just fine. Okay, then next up, we want scaled right surface. And for this one, pygamnotransform.scale, and the surface we want to scale is the right one. And now we are going to need a new scaling, so a new dimension. And in here, for the width, we just want to keep the width of the original right side. And we have a new right height, and this one we can just reuse. That's the one we get up here. And then finally, we want to place scaled right surface. And now we need an X and the Y we already have. So this one can stay the same because both the right and the left side should have the same top part. Although I guess for this one, we can go with top right. So now what we have to figure out is where to place the left side of this surface. And with this one, again, we need the full size of the entire surface, so the full width. And from that, I want to get sides, get the right side. And from that, I want to get the width. And with that, we should be having our right side. And this one is working as well. Cool. Almost done with this part. Now for the bottom side, I want to copy my top side because this one is the closest to it. And now top width is going to become bottom width. We still want to get the full size minus the bottom left dot get width plus the bottom right dot get width. Then we have a scaled bottom surface. And then here we want to place the bottom or we want to scale this one. And we have the bottom width and sides bottom dot get height. And this one should stay the same because we want to keep the same height. Now we have the scaled bottom surface. And now finally, we just need to figure out our position. And the left side is still totally fine. So this one we can just keep. Now we just have to figure out the top. And here again, I want to get the full height of the entire surface. And from that, I want to subtract sides bottom and dot get the height of this one. And with that, we should be done. Let's try this one now. And this is looking nearly done. We have two more issues to work on. We have to fill the center and we have to get rid of the black color on the edges. I guess the center is the easier part because we have this one right here. And for this one, we are going to need two attributes. We need center height and we are going to need center width. And once we have that, we can create a scaled center. And this one then is just going to be pygame.transform.scale. And in here, we already have a sides center. And I just want to scale this to center width and center height. And once we have that, I can just image.blit scaled center, and then I have to figure out an X and a Y. So let's work through these parameters. So let me give a bit more space. Essentially, what we have right now. This thing here, again, is going to be our entire image. And what we have so far is a couple of corners. So these four corners here. And besides that, we have the sides. So we have a left side, we have a top side, we have a right side, and we have a bottom. The only part we don't have yet is this center bit here. And the X and the Y position we're trying to figure out here is going to be this top left position. And the center height and center width is going to be this one for the height and this one for the width. So these are the bits of information we are trying to figure out. 
So for the center height, I want size one. So my height of the entire image. And from that, I want to subtract this bit here and this bit here, which in practice means sides and we want the top and then get underscore height and plus sides and bottom. And this one is also going to get height. So with that, we have the height. Next up, we need to center width. And this one works in pretty much the same way. As a matter of fact, let me copy the entire thing. So now instead of the height, we want to get the width. And now sides, this should be right and this should be left. And now we don't care about the height, we care about the width for both of these. And this one works by itself already. So the last one we have to figure out is the X and the Y part. And in here, essentially what we care about is this point here again. And this point is literally just the width and the height of the top left. So this is what we can pass in here. So I can just get rid of the entire thing and sides. And I want to get the top left and get size. And now let's try this. And there we go. Now we have a filled center. This one feels significantly nicer. The last thing we have to do is to get rid of the black edges. And this one we can do all the way at the top. And really all we have to do in here is set a color key. So set underscore color key. And this essentially tells Pygame to get rid of one specific color, which in our case is 0, 0, and 0. So now the game is looking drastically better. And well, you could add any other color in here. If you ever wanted to get rid of something specific in terms of color in Pygame, this is how you would do it. Especially when you are using sprite sheets, this one is being used all the time. Okay. And with that, we have the entire surface maker. That was way more complicated than I thought it would be. So uh, well done if you could keep up. This one really wasn't easy. Okay, now what we have to do next is actually make sure we get the colors right. So right now they're all red, they're still working, but well, we only have one color. And this is going to happen inside of our sprites. So let me minimize everything else and blocks I want to keep open. So right now, the problem that we have is we always pass red into our surface maker. And obviously that is not ideal. So instead, what I want to do is to use this color legend. And this one basically converts a number to a color. So in my sprites, basically what I want to do is get my color legend and in here pass in the block type and now let's try this one and now we have some nice looking colors already a massive upgrade and uh, let's see if I can get to the second row without dying too often okay uh, not going terribly well but I'm really bad at this game um okay so now we get, this one should disappear. Yep, this is looking good, cool. Now, the one problem that we do have is that the health of the blocks does update, but the color doesn't change with them, which makes the game look kind of weird. So when the ball hits one of these blocks, I want them to change their color. And basically what I want to do, if the block gets damaged, we want to subtract the health by whatever amount we have. And then if our health is greater than zero, I want to create a new self.image. And the image we want to create is self.surfacemaker.get underscore surface. And then here we need to get what kind of block we want to have. And for this one, I am again going to use the color legend. So let me copy it from up here. But now we don't want to look at our block type. Instead, we want to look at our self.health. 
The problem now is that this self.help is an integer. So I want to turn this into a string so that it's going to work with this dictionary here just fine. And the other thing we need are the dimensions of our block. So this is just something we can copy from the initial part and this should be all we need. So now let's try this one again. These blocks still just disappear. This is looking fine. It just takes a second to hit the second row. And yeah, there we go. So now the green blocks turn blue once we hit them. And if we, I hope I can hit them again. So they are disappeared. And I guess we can try to go to the third row and see if this one still works. And yeah, there we go. This seems to be working really, really well. Nice. So with that, I think we have a really basic game. So that was a really long section. Um, sorry, that got a bit complicated. I hope you could follow along. We definitely got over the worst part. Now we can work on the easier bits. And the next part I want to work on is adding some hearts. So the player can see how many hearts are left. And if there are zero left, then the game is over. This part should be really simple. In fact, let's jump straight back into the code and let's implement all of this. Here I'm back in main.py and in my init method. I would like to add another section and let's call this one hearts. And all I really want to do in here is self.hard underscore surface is going to be pygame.image.load and the path towards that is going one fold up then graphics, then we have other and then hard.png. And don't forget, we want to convert alpha all of this. And now I want to run another method or well, create another method that I called display arts. We need self and nothing else. And in here, let me give a bit more space. I want to do something like for I in the amount of health the player has. Let's say for now, it's just going to be free. We're going to make this a bit more flexible in just a second. And well, if that is the case, I just want to self dot display surface dot blit. And now again, I need a surface and a position. The surface is very easy. It's self dot hard surface. Now for the position, we are going to need X and Y. Now Y in my case is really easy. I just set this to four so that we have four pixels between the top of our heart and the top of the window. Now X is going to be a bit more difficult and essentially all I want to achieve. Let's say we have three hearts or well, in my case, boxes, but doesn't really matter. And what we have to place is this left side. And essentially what I want to do, I want to get this I here and multiply it with the width of each of these hearts. So if I is zero, this is going to be zero. But if I is one, then this position here is going to be one times the width of each of these surfaces. So if the heart is 40 pixels wide, this would be 40. And that way, these surfaces would be right next to each other. That's really the entire idea here. And let's put all of this in a separate variable. Let's actually call it x. I want to get i and multiply this with self dot hard surface and get underscore width. And in my run method, I can just, let's put it in draw the frame. So self dot display arts. And if I run this now, we are getting an error that, oh, this shouldn't be free. This should be a range object. So now let's try this again. There we go. Now we can see hearts, although we have another problem now that hearts are overlapping with all of the blocks, which isn't ideal right now. And what I have done to overcome this is in here, I have set a top offset. And all this one really is, is the window height divided by 30. And now 
when we run the stage setup, so this one we created a while back, and we are placing Y. I want to add the top offset to all of that. So we basically just move all of these positions down by a few pixels. So now if I run this, we have some more space at the top. That's really all we did, which feels much cleaner. And to make this thing a bit more clean, I want to add a bit of a gap between each of the hearts, which also isn't difficult to add. Let me minimize these other methods again. So basically all I want to do is make this width wider than the actual surface. So let's put it in brackets and let's say plus four. And now if I run this, there is a bit more space between them. Might even be a bit too much. Let's put this to two, if that feels better. Yeah, that definitely feels better. And now to give them a bit of an offset to the left, I want to add two to all of this. So now let's try this again. And now the hearts look really nice. The one thing we now need to figure out is that this three right now is entirely static. So instead, I want to change this to self.player.com arts or lives or whatever you want to put in there, it doesn't really matter. So then in my player class, I have to add another attribute in here that is self.hearts. And by default, this is going to be free. So now if I run this, we shouldn't be seeing any change and we don't. But now if I change self.hearts to let's say something like 10, this is looking perfectly fine, but let's keep it at free. And now all we have to figure out is that if the player misses the ball, this self.hearts should be reduced by one. So let me minimize the player. And here we have the ball. And in our window collision, we have this part here where we check if the ball has failed. And if that is the case, we just want to set self.player.hearts minus equal one. And now let's try this. So there we go, we lost one heart. If I do this again, we're losing another heart. I can do this again. And now we have zero hearts. So this doesn't help us. And essentially all we want to do in my run method. So let me minimize the display hearts. And now what I want to do in my event loop, right now I'm checking if event type is pygame.quit. And I want to add or self.player.hearts is smaller or equal to zero. And now let's try this again. And let me deliberately fail this time. And now the game should end. There we go. Now the game ended by itself. So this is also working well. So with that, we have some hearts. So let me minimize all of these methods. The game is getting quite complex. So for the next part, I want to work on the upgrades. Basically, whenever a block gets destroyed, we want to create an upgrade. And this is just going to be a simple sprite that falls downwards. And if it collides with the player, the player gets some kind of upgrade. So the player could become wider, it could get lasers, it could get faster, and it could get an extra life. I think those are the four upgrades I have. And that's basically it. So let's go straight to it and let's implement all of this. Here I'm back in main.py. And the first thing I want to do is in sprites.py because in here I want to create another class. And this one will be called upgrade. And again, this is going to be pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. And it's not going to be a complicated class. All we really are going to do is give this an init method. We need self, we need a position, we need the upgrade type, and we need what groups this thing is supposed to be part of. And now in here, we again need our super dunder init method and pass the groups in here. And now, first of all, self.upgrade type, we want to turn into an attribute. So upgrade type. Next up, we have to create a self.image and self.rect. And for the image, I just need pygame.image.load. And for the path here, I want to create an f string for the simple reason that my path is one folder up, graphics, upgrades, and inside of upgrades, I have my upgrade type. And let me illustrate what that means. 
So here's the folder. We have graphics, we have upgrades, and in upgrades, we have hard, laser, size, and speed. And when I have my upgrade type, they are going to be named in the same fashion. And that way, all of this is working. And don't forget, we need to convert alpha this as well. And now for the rectangle, all we need is self.image.getRect. And in here, the mid top should be the position we place in there. And now, since we are going to move this, we also need self.pos, which is going to be pygame.math.vector2 with self.rect.top left. And then we need self.speed, which I have set to 300. And this thing also is going to need an update method that needs self and delta time. And this part is going to be super simple. We just want to move it downwards. So self.post.y plus equal self.speed multiplied by delta time. And for this one, we don't need any kind of direction because, well, we only move in one direction. And now we also have to set self.rect.y is going to be round self.post.y. And there's one more important thing that if self.rect.top is greater than window height, let's say plus 100. And if that is the case, we want to destroy the sprite just so that we are making sure that we don't end up with too many upgrades that we can't get rid of anymore. So this is a totally fine upgrade class. Now we just have to figure out when to spawn them. So we need some kind of information in our block because the block knows when the block is being destroyed. The problem is that the player also needs access to these upgrades. So I want to keep the upgrades a bit more accessible. So what I'm going to do, I am going to import the upgrades to my main.py file. And in here, I am going to create another method. And this one I'm going to call create upgrade. And this one needs self and nothing else. And in here, first of all, I want to create an upgrade type, which should just be a random item from a list. So we need choice again, which we don't have right now. So from random import choice. But now what kind of list do we have? And this list I want to keep in my settings. So in here, I have another entry I want to add. And this one just looks like this. So I have my upgrades, I have speed, laser, heart, and size. And those are the same items I have in the folder. So now I can just copy upgrades and pass it in here. And with that, I am going to get a random upgrade. Now, next up, I want to actually create the upgrade class or one instance of that. And now let me copy all of the parameters we need. We need position, upgrade type, and groups. Now position, I want to get from the parameters. How that works, you're gonna see in just a second. Upgrade type is gonna be upgrade type. This one we already have. Now, next up, this one always has to be in all sprites. But besides that, I want to create another group that I called upgrade sprites. And this we need to create in our sprite group setup. So self.upgrade sprites is going to be pygame.sprite.group. So all we have to figure out now is when to call this method here. And this I want to call from the blocks. So in my stage setup, when I am creating a block, they should have this create upgrade. So I'm going to pass this function in there as an argument. So make sure here to not call this method. I just want to pass the function itself or the method itself. And this should be self.create upgrade. So now let me minimize everything else. In the block, we need another argument. And that is create upgrade. And let me add another section down here. So self.create upgrade is going to be create upgrade. And before we are destroying the sprite, I want to self.create an upgrade. 
and to position I want to pass in here is self dot rect dot center. And that should be all we needed. So let's try now. And we are getting an error. And that is that we cannot find the file, graphics, upgrades, and speed. And the problem here is quite simple. So in my upgrade class, iGame is unable to find this file here. And the reason for that is that this one needs .png at the end. So now let's try this again. Now we have another error. This vector2 should be capitalized. And next attempt, there we go. Now we have a couple of upgrades. I hope we get some more different ones. Yep, this is looking good. We get a lot of speed ones. I don't actually know why. I think it's just random. Okay, um, the random module is very strange today. Yeah, okay, this one's looking better. Okay, um, yeah, this one I think is getting better. Cool, so it's definitely working, except something is wrong with the random module today that we don't seem to get proper randomness. Um, all right. This is working just fine. Now, the problem is that we don't want to spawn an upgrade every single time a block dies. So we only want to randomly call this method here in like 20 or 30% of the cases. And in my case for that, I used randint. So we have to import that one as well. And all I really have done in here is if randint between zero and 10 is smaller than three, and only then I'm going to create an upgrade. So let's try this one now. We don't get an upgrade. Now we should be getting one very soon. Uh -huh. Let's hope it's still working. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah. The numbers might be a bit very low, but they are working. For the purpose of this tutorial, I can change this to smaller than nine so we can see something. And there, we definitely get more of them. Okay, so it is definitely working. Now, next up, what we have to figure out is the collision between the player and the upgrades. And that is just going to be another method inside of our main game. So in here, let's call it upgrade collision. This one needs self and nothing else. And in here, again, we have to create overlap sprites. And this could actually be a good challenge that I want you guys to check the collision or well, the overlap between the player and the upgrades. And if that is the case, I want you guys to write another method inside of the player and call it from this method here by passing in the sprite type of the upgrade and see how far you get. Now, first of all, I need pygame.sprite.sprite collide. And I need self.layer. I need self.upgrade sprites for the group. And then do kill has to be true. And now for sprite in overlap sprites i want in my player to run some kind of upgrade method and there is going to be one argument and that's going to be sprite dot upgrade type so in my sprites let's minimize every single thing in here they always have an upgrade type and this is what i want to place inside of that method so now inside of our player we need to create another method let me minimize everything else in here. So define upgrade. We need self and we need an upgrade type. And for now, let's just say we want to print the upgrade type. And let's see if this is working. Oh, actually right now it cannot work because we are not calling this method. And this I want to do when I update the game. So self dot upgrade collision and there were no arguments. So let's try this now and we get size, we get no upgrade, we get speed and I am surprisingly bad at this. We get size again and we get heart and laser. Oh, and the game ended because I ran out of hearts, but it's definitely working. So now in here, 
we just have to figure out what to do with these upgrades. And well, let's go through them one by one. So the first one is if upgrade type is equal to speed. And if that is the case, self.speed, I want to set to plus equal 50. And if upgrade type, I call this one hard, I want to set self.hards plus equal one. And let's see if those two are working. Let's hope I can get a heart. And there we got a heart and we lost the heart, but I hope you saw it. Um, okay, let's try this one again. Speed, this one. Uh, okay, I do have to try to get a heart without losing a heart straight away. But uh, okay, seems more difficult than it looks. Okay, there we go. The laser, last try. Okay, but I think you get the idea. I don't want to stretch this out too much. Yeah, we can get a heart. Ah, there we go. Now we have four hearts, so this is working. Nice. Next up, we have if upgrade type is equal to size. And in this case, we want to increase or create a new width. And this we get with self.rect.width and multiply this with 1.1. So our new width is going to be 10% wider than the old width. And this I want to use to create a new self.image. And this, again, I am going to use my surface maker for with get underscore surface. We have to pass in layer. And now we need our new width. And for the height, I just want to get self.rect.height. So this way we are going to get a new image. And now I also have to update the position. So self.rect is going to be self.image.get underscore rect. And the center is going to be self.rect.center. So where the old center used to be. And now since we updated the rectangle, self.post.x has to be self.rect.x. So this one doesn't get confused. And now before we are going to try this, let me in the create upgrade method, comment this one out, and let's change the upgrade type to size. So now we should only get size upgrades, and this should make it easier to visualize what's going on. Uh, this seems to be working just fine. We are definitely growing quite well. Yeah, this is definitely working. And in here again, we need the surface maker to keep this surface looking good. If we didn't do it, this would stretch out more and more and look increasingly weird. Um, okay, but this one is certainly working. All right, nice. So now I can set this one back to normal. And finally, we have to work on the lasers. So if upgrade type is equal to laser. And all I want to do inside of this method is self dot laser amount plus equal one. And for that to work, we first of all need a laser. So let me add another section here, laser and self dot laser amount by default is going to be zero. And since we want to display an extra graphic, if there is a laser, we have to import another surface. Let's call this one laser surface. And in here, we need pygame.image.load as always. And the path is going to be one folder up, graphics, other, laser.png, and as always, convert alpha. And another thing I do want to do is self.laser underscore rects. And by default, it's going to be an empty list. You're going to see in a second how that is going to work. Now, the upgrade method we are done with. And what I want to do is self. Let's call it display lasers. It needs self and nothing else. And in here, I want to check if self.laser amount 
is greater than zero. So if that is true, we know there is going to be a laser. And now what I'm trying to do, this is the size of our player. And I want to place lasers there dynamically. Now I know the bottom of the laser, it's going to be here. And now I just have to figure out where on the X coordinate I have to place my lasers. So here, here, and here, and so on. So how can I figure that one out? And essentially what I did, I am always dividing the entire width of the surface by the amount of lasers plus one. So if we have one laser, we are going to divide the player by one over two. If we have two lasers, we are going to divide the player into three bits. And then this distance here, we are going to use from the left to place the laser. So if we only have, let me use a different color, if we only have a single laser, we are going to go from this point on the left, halfway of the size of the player, and place the center of the laser here. And if we have two lasers, so this part here, we are going to go one third, so roughly here, and then we are going to go another third, so roughly here, and place a laser here and here. And then the more lasers we get, the smaller this distance is going to get. And first of all, I want to get what I called a divider length. And this one is just going to be self.rect.width divided by self.laser amount plus one. And now for i in range self.laser amount, I want to create a new rectangle. Let's call it laser rect. And this laser rectangle is going to be self.laser underscore surf dot get underscore rect. And I want to place the mid bottom of this rectangle. And this one is going to be needing an X and a Y position. Now the Y position is easy. It's just self.rect.top. So the top of the player. X again is going to be a bit more complex. So let me place this one in a separate variable. And essentially all I really want to do in here is self.rect.left plus divider length. And I want to multiply this with I. However, the problem now is that this I by default is going to be zero. So I want to take this I and add plus one to it. And now we are very nearly done. Once we have this list, I can just loop over for laser rect in self dot laser rects. Enter there, self dot display surface, which I think the player has. No, the player actually doesn't have. So we have to import the display surface in here as well. And let's do it straight in the setup. So self dot display surface is going to be pygame dot display dot get underscore surface. And this is going to get us the display surface. And this I now want to use down here and then blit our self dot laser surface and then the laser rect. I want the one thing I forgot is self dot laser rects dot append laser rect. So the problem we have right now, if we left the code like this, we would keep on adding more and more lasers. So at the beginning of this method, I'm going to set self.laserRects to an empty list. That way we are creating all of this from scratch every single time. And all right, the only thing we have to do now is to actually call all of this. So all the way at the bottom of my laser, self.display lasers and let's see if this is working so we don't get an error so far and if i now have a laser we can't see anything 
Now, the reason for that is this. We are basically drawing our lasers inside of this method here. So when we update the sprite, we are calling display lasers. The issue is then we are drawing the background after that. So if I were to move my background on top of all of this, then we should be able to see lasers. So now let's try this and there we can see a laser. It doesn't do anything right now, but it definitely works. And even if we have two lasers, let me try a few more times. Maybe I find a few more. Now, the important thing here is that this laser mechanic also works with multiple lasers. And even if the player gets wider, this system still works. So, okay, we get faster, but this seems to be working just fine. And somehow Pygame really likes the speed upgrade for some reason. Okay, let's try this one again. And right now you can see because we have too many upgrades, it looks a bit silly, but it definitely works. So I guess we can just draw the background here and this one still works just fine. Cool. So now we can see the lasers. So let me minimize this one and let me minimize this one as well. This one as well. Now we have to figure out the projectors for the laser. And I guess let me minimize all of the stuff here so it's a bit easier to see what's going on. Now for the projectile, this is just going to be another sprite that this one just moves upwards. So I want to add another part in here and let's call it the projectile. And this one is just going to be self.projectile underscore surface. And for this one, we need pygame.image.load. And in here, the path is going to be one folder up, graphics, then other, and then projectiles.png. And don't forget to convert alpha all of this again. So now we have an image of a projectile. Let me minimize the init method again. And now I want to create another method and this is going to be create projectile need self and nothing else and all i really need to do here is for projectile in self dot player dot laser underscore rects so the rectangle list we just created and if that is the case i want to create a projectile instance of a class that does not exist yet. So we have to create this one as well. And this happens again in sprites. So let's do it all the way at the top and class projectile. And again, this is just going to be pygame.sprite.sprite. .sprite. And this one is just about to be the easiest class you can have. So this one needs an image and a rectangle and then also a position and a speed so we can move it upwards. And this could be a good challenge for you. So try to create this entire class. It should only be about 10 lines of code in total. And you will need a position. You have the surface from main.py and you will need the groups to place it in all sprites. So see how far you get. First of all, I again need a dunder init method. And this one is going to need self, a position, is surface and groups. And now in here, I again need a super dunder init method that is going to get groups as an argument. Then I need self.image is going to be the surface we get from the parameters and self.rect is going to be self.image.get underscore rect and we want to place the mid bottom where we have our position. Now, besides that, we again need self.position and this is pygame.math.vector2 and here is self.rect.topLeft. And finally, self.speed. In my case, it's just 300. It's basically random. Choose whatever you like. Now, once we have that, I need an update method with self and delta time. And in here, 
all we are going to do is self.post.y minus equals self.speed multiplied with delta time and then self.rect.y is going to be rounded self.post.y. And finally, we again want to check if self.rect.bottom is smaller or equal to negative 100. So now, since the laser is moving upwards, we want to check if the bottom of the laser is on top of the window. And if that is the case, we want to destroy that sprite. Again, here, if we don't need a sprite on the window, we shouldn't keep it around. It might hamper our performance. But all right, this is all we need for our projectile. So now back in my main.py. Actually, before I do that, let me copy all of the parameters and place them in here. And let me fix the typo on player. First of all, we are going to need a position. And in here, I want to go with projectile.midtop. And remember, projectile in this case refers to a laser rectangle. But I don't want this thing to spawn right on top of it. I want to give it an offset. So I want to subtract pygame.math.vector2, 0 in x, and let's say 30 in the y direction. And you have to use a vector here because midtop is essentially a tuple. OK, next up, surface. This one is the easiest. All we need in here is self.projectile surface. And let me put all of these arguments on separate lines so all of this is easier to read. OK, now, finally, for the groups. As with all the other sprites, this one has to be in all sprites. But I also want another group with self.projectile sprites. And this, again, has to be in the init method. We need self.projectile sprites. It's going to be pygame.sprite.group. And now the last thing we need is to actually run this method whenever the player presses space. And this, in my case, is going to happen in the run method in this event loop. So if the player is pressing space, I want to run self.create projectile. And let's see if this is working. And we are getting an error that there is no file called projectiles. And I think the reason is I call this one projectile, not projectiles. So in the init method, this should be just projectile. Now let's try this again. Does seem to work. Oh yeah, and we have no lasers right now. So just to keep the game running. When the game is starting, I want my player to already have two lasers. So now if I press, we get some kind of laser. The issue we have now is if I press really fast, we have more and more lasers, which is a bit too easy for all of this. So I want there to be some kind of timer that makes sure that the player cannot fire continuously. And for that, I want to create self dot, let's call it can underscore shoot. And by default, this one is going to be true. And besides that, we need self dot shoot time. By default is just going to be zero. It doesn't really matter what it is. And now in the event loop, we only want to be able to create a projectile if self dot can shoot. And once we have done that, self dot can shoot is going to be false. So now if I run this, we should be able to shoot once, but not again, which seems to be the case. So this one works perfectly well right now. So what we have to create now is another method that works as a timer to reactivate can shoot. And this one, just another self dot, let's call it laser timer. We need self and nothing else in here. And basically what I want to do, let me create a timeline. So this is the timeline of our game. And essentially what I want to do, if the player has shot a laser at this time here, let's say this is one second. From this point, I want to check our time. 
So I check the time here. And let's say at some point we get to the second second. And as a consequence, I know that this difference here is going to be one second. And if this distance is greater than one second, I want to reactivate the laser. Now, in practice, it should be less than one second. One second really is quite long. I think for mine, half a second felt perfectly fine. But the idea is quite simple. Now, first of all, I need to figure out the time when the player has shot the laser. And this also happens down here, when we actually shoot the laser. All I need is self.shootTime, the other attribute I just created. And self.shootTime is just going to be pygame.time.get underscore ticks. And now in my laser timer, I can run if pygame.time.get ticks. So this is always going to be our current time. And from that, I want to subtract self shoot time. And if that number is greater than, let's say 500 milliseconds, I want to set self dot can shoot back to true. And that is all we needed for a timer. So now when we are updating our game, self dot laser timer, and let's run this still works. I can keep on pressing space, but now we only shoot in half a second intervals, which I think is looking kind of okay. So let me minimize the run method. As a matter of fact, I want to minimize all methods. So it looks a bit cleaner. Okay, now there's one more method that we are going to need. So let's create another method. And let's call this one projectile block collision. We need self and nothing else in here. And now we basically have to write one simple method. So I want to check for projectile in self dot projectile sprites. And in here, I again want to get my overlap sprites. And this is just going to be pygame.sprite dot sprite collide. And I want to check one sprite, which is going to be my projectile. Then I want to check my self dot block sprites. And finally, it should be false because we do not want to destroy the sprite. And now in here, I want to check if there are overlapping sprites in the first place. And if there is an overlapping sprite, I want to check for a sprite in overlap sprites. And if that is the case, I just want to call sprite.get underscore damage to one amount of damage. So this get damage we have already created. Let me have a look. So in the block class, we have get damage. And this one we created for the ball, but we can reuse it for the projectiles. So get damage one. And now what is really important, we also have to destroy the projectile. So if there's an overlap, I want to call projectile.kill. And if we didn't do this line of code, we would get more and more overlaps here and the lasers would basically destroy all of the blocks in one go. And all right, now all we have to do is to actually call this method. So self.projectile.lockcollision. And let's try this one. And this seems to be working just fine. Obviously, it's really, really strong. So you do want to be careful in using it. But by itself, this is working very, very well. And does make the game significantly more fun and also a lot easier. Okay, but definitely some progress. And now we are nearly done. There are two more things that I would like to cover. And that is CRT styling and sounds. Now, sounds is incredibly easy. We just have to import a couple of sounds and play them at certain points in our game. So that's not a part I'm really concerned about. The more important bit is the CRT styling. And this one, well, it's not particularly complicated. But essentially, what we are going to do, we are going to create another surface on top of our game. And on this new surface, we are going to create some black lines and a vignette. And this one is going to simulate this old CRT style. 
And then we are going to alternate the opacity of this between some random values. And that way we are getting the illusion of flickering. Here we are back in main.py. And inside of this file, I would like to create another class. And this one I called CRT. There is no inheritance, but we do need an init method. And this one itself and nothing else. And in here, we first of all want to import the vignette. And this one is just going to be an image. So we can just import it as vignette. And to import it, we need pygame.image.load. And the path that we need is one folder up, graphics, other, and in there I have a file called tv.png. And in here, make sure to convert alpha, all of this. The problem we have right now is that this vignette is not scaled up properly. But this we can change, let's call this one self.scaled vignette. And in this case, we want this vignette to have the exact same size as our window. Otherwise, it would look kind of weird that we have one part of the shadow going outside of the window. So all I really want to do is pygame.transform.scale. I want to pass in my vignette in here. And now I need a width and a height. And all that really means is the window width and the window height. So now I have a vignette. And now there's one more thing that we are going to need. And that is self.displaySurface. And this again, we are getting with pygame.display.get underscore surface. And now that we have all of that, we can actually test this method or this class. And essentially all I want to do is create a draw method that needs only self. And for now, I just want to get self.displaySurface.blit and I want to blit my self.scaled vignette at position zero and zero. And this method I would like to run in game.run after we have drawn all of the other elements. And this could be a challenge for you. So try to call this draw method to draw this vignette on top of all of the other elements. First of all, in my game init method, I have to create an instance of CRT. So let's call it CRT and self.crt is going to be CRT. And now let me minimize all of the methods so it's a bit easier to see what's going on. In the run method now, after we have drawn all of the other elements, I want to add, let's call it CRT styling. And all I really have to do in here is self.crt.draw. And now let's see what we get. This is then already looking a bit better. So now we have some vignette that doesn't look half bad. The problem is that this vignette is too dark right now. So especially in the top left and top right, we can hardly see the blocks, which isn't ideal. So we want to lower the opacity of this surface here. And while we are doing that, I want to set this to a random opacity on every single frame. And essentially what that means, I want to get myself dot scaled vignette and set the alpha to one value. And you could set, for example, 16 here. And if you run this now, this is looking much less pronounced. Oh, and now we can see the hearts again as well. That one was missing before as well. And in here, 255 would be the maximum and zero would be, well, nothing. So if we have 60, we are at about a quarter, something like that. But in my case, I don't want to keep this at 60. Instead, I want to get a random integer, which I don't have yet, so I have to import it. So import rand in from random. And now I want to have an alpha value, let's say between 70 and 90. And since this updates every single frame, we should be getting some very light flickering. May even be a little bit too strong, but you can play around with this. Let's say we can set this to 75 and 
Yeah, I think this feels good. So with that, we already have our vignette. Now, besides that, what we also want to do is create another method and let's call this one create CRT lines. And this is to simulate the lines that old TVs used to have. And then here we need self and nothing else. And basically all we are going to do now is we are going to take this scaled vignette and we are going to draw a couple of lines on top of it. So if I'm drawing all of this, here we have our entire window. And right now on another surface, we have the vignette that covers something like this area here. So all of this yellow bit is our vignette. And on the same surface where we have the vignette, I want to create a couple of lines, quite a few. And this one is going to simulate these old TV lines. So we are basically going to take the scaled vignette surface and paste something on them. And to get this started, we first of all need a couple of parameters. The first one is the line height, which in my case I've set to four. So that's the distance between each line. And then once we have that, we need a line amount. And essentially what we are going to do in here is window height floor divided by the line height. So if our window height is 720 and we have a line height of four, we should be getting about 180 lines, I think. And once we have that, all we have to do is for line in range line amount. And now basically all I want to do is pygame.draw.line. I need a surface, so self.scaled vignette. Then I'm going to need a color, which in my case will be black. And then I will need a start position and an end position. And I would recommend for you to try to figure out the start and the end position for each individual line here. So see if you can figure this out yourself. Now, the first thing that we are going to need is that both the start and the end position is an X and a Y position, or rather a value. And we know for the start position, since the line is always starting on the left side, X is always going to be zero. And we know on the end point of that line, it's always on the right side of the window. So this one can just be window width. The actually interesting part is the Y position. And this I want to store in a separate variable. And in here, well, all we really have to do is get our line. So this number here, and this would be a number between zero and 180 right now. And this I want to multiply with my line height meaning the first line would be on position zero, the second on position four, then position eight, and this would then go all the way up to 720. And this is now giving us Y. And now finally, all we need to do is define a line width, which in my case, I'm gonna go with one. And now all we have to do in the init method, call self.create CRT lines, and this should be working. And there we go. Now we have some CRT lines. I guess the effect might be a little bit too strong, so we might want to work with the opacity a tiny bit more. But other than that, I think this is looking pretty good. And let's change the opacity to 60 to 75. Yeah, I guess this one's working. I guess another thing that you could be doing is change this black to a slightly brighter value. So let's say 20, 20, and 20. And that makes the lines less visible as well. But well, play around with this and see what you think looks best. But I'm quite happy with this. And all right, with that, we have our CRT. So now all we have to do is to add the sound and we are done with it. And we have a couple of different sounds. 
So we have fail, impact, laser, laser hit, music, and power up. Which basically play when the ball is failing, when the ball hits a block, when the laser is being shot, when the laser hits, the background music, and when the player gets a power up. So these are all the sounds you want to play under certain circumstances. And this should be one of the easiest parts of this tutorial. So let's go through them one by one. And this really shouldn't be too hard. In fact, I would recommend you to try to implement all of the sounds yourself. If you've gotten this far, this really shouldn't be much of a challenge. I guess I can start with the ball. This one is going to have quite a few different sounds. And in here, let me minimize all of the methods in the init method. I want to add some sounds. And the first sound I get is self.impact sound. And to import a sound, we need pygame.mixer.sound. And in here, we need to go one fold up and sounds and then impact.wav. And now what I also want to do is self.impactsound.set underscore volume. And I've set this to 0 0.1, so 10% of the original volume. It did get quite loud. And besides that, I want to have self.fail sound. And this one is pygame.mixer.sound. We need the same folder, so one folder up, sounds, and then we have fail.wav. And now self.failsound.set volume. This one should also be 10%. And now in the window collision down here, if the ball is failing, we want to play self.failsound.play. And that's all we needed. Besides that, in the other collisions, if there's any collision in here, or in here, we want to play that sound. I want to call this inside of each individual if statement. So in here, self.impactsound.play. And this I can now just copy around for each of the if statements. And there we go. And all right, with that, we should be having some sounds. And we're getting an error message that sounds.fail doesn't exist. That's easy to fix. All I have to do is change the dot to a slash. And now let's try this again. And we should be having some impact sounds and some fail sounds. This is working quite well. Cool. So with that, we have the sounds for the ball. It wasn't all that hard, actually. I guess next up, we can work in main and in the game class, because in here, we are going to have a few more sounds. Just to save me some writing, let me just copy all of this. This should speed things up a good bit. And what I want to get are these sounds. So we have the laser sound, we have a power up sound, and we have a laser hit sound. And all of them are set to 10%, except for the laser hit sound. This one is even less loud because, um, I don't know, this felt better. There wasn't really a specific reason. And now all we have to figure out is when to play these sounds. And since we have dedicated functions or well methods for each of them, we can just work with that. So create upgrade, we can ignore create BG. We can ignore stage setup. We don't need display hearts. We don't need upgrade collisions. That's the first one we need, because in here, if there's a collision, self power up sound dot play. And then in create projectile, if we are creating a projectile, I want to play that sound. And this shouldn't be in the projectile, because if we play the same sound multiple times, it might sound weird. So I just want to play this one sound once. So self dot laser sound dot play. And now finally, we have projectile block collision. And in here, for every overlap, we want to play the sound. So self dot laser hit sound, I think I called it dot play. And let's try all of this. 
And this feels a lot more arcadey. And yeah, this really changes the feel of the game substantially. Cool. Quite happy with that. Add now. Back in the init method. Let me minimize everything again. And I just want to look at the init method. There's one more thing that we do need. And that is self.music. And this one we get with pygame.mixer.sound. And in here, basically the same path. We want to get to sounds. And in there, we have music.wav. And for this one, we want self.music.set volume to 0 0.1. And this one, we want to play straight away. So self.music.play. And in here, we need one argument. And that is loops which should be negative one, so we play this continuously. And now we should be done. Okay, cool. That was it. That tutorial ended up a good bit longer than I expected, but I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you around.